you got to remember in the studio, no one's really watching you, so anything goes. I've sat next to a guitar player holding the strings that he wasn't playing to yep. keep them from ringing. Or take We've a piece taped, of tape, tape off them. the extra strings that aren't being used. Yeah, I've been down on my hands and knees, like manipulating pedals while it's going. It's like, you just got to do whatever you got to do to wrangle it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. This episode is sponsored by Sonarworks, helping you get the most out of your mixes by correcting the sound of the speakers and headphones in your studio so you get your mix right the first time. Are you sick of doing multiple mixes and still you can't get the low end right? How would it feel to have badass bass the first time? Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com. Are you ready to rock the perfect mix? This episode is sponsored by OWC. Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, your trusted source for memory and speed upgrades, DIY installs, and use Macs for your studio. Let OWC focus on keeping your studio Mac in killer condition so that you can focus on making great music. Why ditch your existing Mac when you can take your studio far into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and learn how you can supercharge your studio Mac. The speed to create, the capacity to dream. Find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars! It's your host Lidge Shaw, and welcome to Recording Studio Rock Stars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Paul Moak. A five-time Grammy-nominated ASCAP award-winning producer, engineer, mixer, songwriter, and musician based right here in Nashville, Tennessee, and particularly Barry Hill, where there's a great collection of studios. Paul has amassed credits on more than 500 albums, spanning a wide variety of genres with artists like Goodbye June, Joy Williams, Matt Kearney, The Weeks, John Paul White of The Civil Wars, Mark Broussard. Caitlin Smith, Reliant K, The Blind Boys of Alabama, Leagues, House of Heroes, and many more, just to name a few, though. Paul's work has appeared on numerous platinum and gold albums, exceeding 10 million in sales and been featured on hit TV shows such as Nashville, One Tree Hill, Private Practice, The Vampire Diaries, and also TV spots for College Game Day, Bows. American Family Insurance, and Taco Bell. Dang, <laughs> make a run for the border, dude. <laughs> you might see Paul riding around Nashville on his vintage motorcycle on his way to his awesome studio in Berry Hill called The Smoke Stack. That's spelled S-M-O-A-K-S-T-A-C-K, where he records bands from start to finish with a focus on creating an environment that is ready for to capture the magic that happens when bands play together. The Smokestack has a beautiful collection of instruments, recording gear, console, and tape machines, paired with a focused staff that keeps the studio ready for anything at any time. Their mission is that when you walk in the door as a band and start playing, they're going to be totally ready to hit record and capture what you do. I met Paul recently through our good friend Mark Rubel at Blackbird Academy, so thanks again to you, Mark, for the introduction. Please welcome Paul Moak to Recording Studio Rockstars. Paul. Thanks for well, having me. I just elbowed my table. Are you ready to <laughs> rock, dude? <laughs> I'm ready to rock. So um, I hope my energy is good today, Rockstars, in full transparency. Um, Paul was kind enough to come over and do the interview here with me, but I, I was trying to, you know, uh, be in good shape and went to the gym and pulled my back out. So I'm, I'm like, you know, hobbled over and sitting in a comfy chair today. So if I sound all chilled out, that could be part of the reason. We can keep it chill, man. It's all good, man. Yeah. Um, so welcome to the show, dude. I, I've kind of uh, given a bit of an introduction, but, you know, you have on your website for your studio, you got this wonderful video that's like a great little mini doc about you. And it shows you riding your motorcycle across town to come to the studio and just talks about your mission. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. I mean, you know, before this, you started talking about 
moving to Nashville to make records and stuff. How, how'd you get started in all this? And, you know, briefly, how, how did you get to be where you are today making these great records? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a long journey, man, just probably like yourself and uh, most of the people that are in our business. But uh, it kind of started for me, I won a guitar off the radio. Really? Like, no yeah. way. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I was, so I've, I've been into music like my whole life as a, a listener and always just fascinated with sounds and stuff, but uh, it really didn't click until uh, it was the mid nineties and I was probably, uh, you know, 14, 15 years old yeah. and uh, the real yellow pages had just come out and they were trying to show how fast that the real yellow pages were faster than the normal yellow pages, you know? <laughs> and so... And we're not online yet. We're no, just talking no, no. about books I at mean, this point. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, so the local rock radio station in Jackson, Mississippi had a contest where you call in and they would say like, look up recording studio rock stars. If you can find the phone number in under 30 seconds, we'll give you a prize. And it was an electric guitar. And I'd asked my parents for an electric and uh, they had just maybe two years before that bought me a drum kit off a guy at church and and I it it just never really like I tried so hard and I could not I'm just not a drummer it never took off you know so in my mind I was like all right guitar that's gonna be my thing you know and they're like well we just bought you this drum kit and you you know you never play it anymore or whatever so uh we had two phone lines at the time because, again, it's the 90s. Yeah. I had an older sister. And you're in Mississippi, right? Yeah. So, so they're thinking like John Spencer Blues Explosion. That's what they're hoping from yeah. you and your drums, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so so uh, my I got on my sister's phone line, and I told my mom what, what I was doing. I was like, when I yell downstairs, start calling this number. And they're like, all right, you know, call in and. I kept getting a busy tone and finally I had like a, a little handheld radio and they said, all right, we have on the line, Gene Moak. And I was like, no way. And I ran into the kitchen. <laughs> She's flipping through the yellow pages and uh, she found whatever it was they were looking for. And, and being from Mississippi, there's a company called PV. That's what I was asking about your two Right, right. Oh, uh, that's right. PV's from Meridian, Meridian. or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I won a PV, basically a Strat copy. It was called a PV Predator. And uh, so I went to the store to pick it up. And then it kind of became like a pyramid scheme of sorts because I've got this electric, but I don't have anything to play it through. And so I got a job at the music store so I could get nice. an amp. And, uh, and that's really where it all started for me, man, just being around guitars in a guitar store and and uh, it so, how, how close is Meridian to that? There, Meridian's a lot uh, uh, more like, south or something, right? Uh, no, it's actually straight uh, east, about of two, two and a half hours, maybe. Okay, all right. A um, couple of uh, another guest on the show, Pat Sansone. Yeah, is from Meridian too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think John Stewart might have also been there from yeah. there too. John, who plays with um, bass with Wilco. Yeah. Uh, that might be right because I think. I've always just kind of associated PV. them with Stark. I mean, with uh, Oxford because the Ole Miss deal. I think that's oh, yeah, where right. John yeah. went to school. But yeah. Um, so anyway, I won this guitar, and from then on, it was just a mission to do music. And the way I ended up here was, I think, I think my parents saw that this was finally the thing where the light went off, and I came online as a as a young kid, and so my dad was like man, you got to go where people are making music. Like Mississippi is an awesome place culturally and um, and the music history that I was around with the blues and, yeah. and, and even like literary history, like William Faulkner and... Fat Possum Records. Yeah, Fat Possum. Um, all the, all the, you know, the... I don't know if it felt like a resurgence at the time, but like the juke joint kind of music, R.L. Burnside. Yeah, and, for um, sure. Other Turner mm -hmm. was like a famous old fife and drummer who they'd have a festival out at this property. I remember going to to do that. It was really oh, wild cool. to see all that stuff. Yeah, for me being a kid, you know, uh, growing up in the 90s in Jackson, it was like, 
I got to go somewhere where I, if, if guitar is the thing I'm going to do, I need to go somewhere where I can be in some bands, you yeah. know, cause there just wasn't, I was in all of them that right. I could be, in, you yeah. know? So came up to Nashville, uh, straight after high school and was in bands, had record deals, lost record deals, lost bands, uh, was signed to Hollywood at one point. Oh, yeah, uh, right on. Uh, it in ninety nine, and then uh, you know, kind of that Bing was not supposed to happen. <laughs> off phone, off. Oh, you're good, man. Um, but I could never really find my uh, you know Aerosmith or Guns and Roses or whatever it is. Right, the, the band that was just going to make it. Yeah, that you could be part of, and. Uh, I kind of got cast without even realizing it into the side guy thing. Um, Cause all I wanted to do was play. So if someone right, called, you were probably too good at guitar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did love it, man. And you know, I became the guy that when your band lost a guitar player, I'd fill in till you found someone else, you know? And, um, and it just kept leading to bigger touring opportunities. And, and so by my mid twenties, I was, you know, pretty much a A list call guy for touring. And, um, but I had been recording on my own the whole time. I just wasn't making any money at it because I had a four track in high school mm -hmm. and uh, a Yamaha MT4X. I think that's what I, I might have had too. I had a Yamaha. It was a little, little it was one. just like the Tascam one. Uh, but I don't know why I got that. I think. Um, it had built-in EQ and you could bounce tracks, obviously. Yeah. Um, and my mom, I think still has a, a big case of cassettes from my high school. I can't believe I got rid of mine. I, I got rid of mine at one point and then I picked up another one, which, um, sadly probably just sits upstairs, yeah. you know, in a closet, but. I gave mine, uh, to John from Super Drag, who does all of his oh cool, he does Great all band. of his records on. They start on the Yamaha, and it's just hey. Since you backup. brought them up, tell the rock stars who Super Drag is and and what they should. They're know awesome about them. '90s band, uh, Knoxville, I think. Yeah, um, but they, uh, I can't remember what label they were signed to, but they they worked with Nick Rac Rescue Linux on uh, a bunch of records. Uh, the first of which had a hit, and my mind is drawing blank as to what they're that just song doing. Was cool called. stuff. I mean, it was definitely a, a cool indie rock band. I remember seeing them on. I so when I was a kid, Conan O'Brien was after Jay Leno, and in my hometown, they would actually show Access Hollywood between the two. But so Conan didn't even go on till midnight. But he had in the '90s all the cool bands played Conan. I don't know if you remember yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, so I would stay up as as a you know 15, 16 year old kid till two o'clock in the morning watching Conan just to see what band was going to be on. And that's where I first saw them. Um, gosh, I wish I remember that the name of that song. Um, the, the another band that just comes to mind from that era is built to spill. Yeah. You know, I kind of think of, for some reason I lumped them together mentally, Yeah, you know, but so many fun bands from, from the nineties doing, you know, music that's, you know, four piece, five piece band, got a couple of guitars. Yep. Maybe there's some keyboard somewhere in there, you know? Well, and the, the thing that was different about that time is you couldn't just like now, if I wanted to know, Oh, what's Super Drag all about? I can just get online and see every performance they've ever done. Yeah. It's all there, which is amazing. But there was something endearing too at the time about like discovery, real discovery. Yeah, like you like found something. Staying up, knowing the rest of Jackson, Mississippi was asleep while I was seeing what <laughs> cool new band was on Conan, you know? It's uh, kind of a trip, man. Yeah. I mean, it is pretty amazing to be able to learn just about anything about any, just about anything. Yeah. Um, but you know, bottom line is you still got to put in the time. You yeah. can't, you can't short circuit the time. Uh, yeah. At some point you got to watch all those videos to really get to know it too. Well, and man, I used to like, you know, I grew up in the CD era, you know, or whatever. And man, I would pour over the images in the, the CD booklets because that's all you had. Yeah. And there was a mystique around, music that to me 
it, that's a little bit of a bummer about where we're at now. It's like, I don't want to know what uh, Billy Corgan had for breakfast. You know, <laughs> I want, I want him to be this weird supernatural being that goes and makes amazing records. Yeah. And it's guys like that, that, you know, have evolved into the current world that we live in. And so I'm like, Oh cool. Billy Corgan's on Instagram or whatever. And then you go on and it's like, Oh, he's just a normal, just filling goofy up human gas being. tank. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, you know, it's, it's curious to me. So I always like to, I've heard, I've heard many stories about like, you know, over the past 25 years of the way the music industry used to be, you sure. know, and I'm always curious to ask that question of like, well, what's it like for people who are just discovering it now? Like for the younger kids who are just discovering music, you know, what's their version of mystery? I bet they got one, you know, yeah. I bet, I bet like our version of remembering the CDs and how it's different now. They might be like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm sure my parents' generation, when the CDs came out, thought it was probably too the, much information. Yeah, too many ones and zeros. Exactly. Awesome. So, um, you, so you came to Nashville. Uh, you were touring. You're doing all that, doing some recording. At some point, you ended up with this amazing studio called the Smokestack. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, so when I was touring, but recording every minute I could. Uh, you know, it was a constant evolution, just like everybody else. You get your eye on that one, you know, for me, what, <laughs> where it started was I was in a band and we were, we had, uh, tracks that we played with live and this was before laptops. So we had a, uh, um, a digital eight track machine, um, blanking on the name of it. Oh, was it one of those, um, uh, Otari, like. A Betamax cassette. Uh, it was thing, a Roland or? of some some sort. Oh, like a VS eight eighty. Yes, yeah. that was it. It was yeah. the sixteen eighty. Yeah, sixteen eighty. The sixteen and, track. Yeah, and we would use that to. Our drummer had it by him, you know, to, to uh, start the songs or whatever. And when we weren't on the road, I would use it to make demos for friends and stuff. And actually made a couple of records on it. And it started with that. Like, man, it'd be great if I could do a good acoustic vocal. It'd be great. Yeah if we had a better mic for the guitar cabinet or whatever. And, and it was just a constant evolution. And, and I'd been uh, really fascinated with the sound of records. And to me, the missing link was, uh, you know, the, the, what gear did they use to, to make this sound or that sound or whatever. And, so it was always on the hunt and it just kept, it started really with band gear, like guitars, like learning the difference between a Strat and a Les Paul and a Tele and like, oh, this is the Keith Richards sound, you know, yeah. whatever. And, and it evolved into microphones and, and preamps and stuff like that. And uh, really, it's just been a constant evolution until the moment that the the smokestack came to be and really how that happened was I had a house studio and uh, I say house studio, it should have been called studio house because th I lived in about 300 square feet of it and the yeah, rest was. Yeah. Uh, I know that feeling. Which my poor wife, when we got married, you know, moved in and, and uh, it was about a 900 square foot house. And when I bought it, I was probably 20, four at the time and and it was really cheap and it was it was going to be this is where I can kind of set up shop and so I wasn't thinking about living or the need to cook or any of that it was right you know studio. yeah well at that point and I remember it well is like um you think of a place to live and you're like man if I just woke up you know grabbed a cup of coffee yep you know and then sat on my bed and I was staring at a pair of speakers that would be great you yeah know? That was the dream. And yeah. So we, when I bought this place, it had uh, the floor needed to be redone in the kitchen. So I went to this place in Cool Springs called Floors with a Z. <laughs> and was like, what's the cheapest, you know, laminate flooring? It was like black and white checker. I'm like, that looks awesome. Oh, yeah. So I bought. Uh, the, I had that in my kitchen up in the house. The 200 square feet or whatever it was that I needed. I, ha I had a neighbor who came over once and he was like, oh, man. That's nice. Your floor's all checkeredy. Yeah, <laughs> checkeredy. Yeah. So you had a checkeredy uh, floor too. So they I went to put it in, and they were like, 
what do you want us to do with this gas pipe for your stove? And I didn't even have the gas turned on. I was like, well, I'm not getting a stove. So we sawed through it and shoved it through the floor and floored over it. And then a year later, I met my wife and we get married and she moves in. She's like, hey, uh, where's the stove? You know? And so our first two years of marriage, she cooked on a, uh, the crock pot became. You're like, listen, honey, right it's going to be okay. Yeah. They, they talk about this future technology coming called Uber Eats. Yeah. Where you just call and then the food's delivered. We won't need a stove. Exactly. I was like, besides, do you know how many guitar cabinets I can fit where this stove should be? You know. <laughs> anyway, long story longer, uh, I've I got a piano after a while. And when you get a piano, you need a piano tuner. And I found a tuner. It was this really awesome dude named Nicky Chavez uh, who had worked at Seal and he was starting his own thing. So he, w- he would come by and tune my piano. Does he and- show up in an El Dorado? No. <laughs> it sounds like he should. Uh, man, I don't. He drove some kind of beater. I can't remember what it was. It was a hippie <laughs> dude, nev- like yourself, never wore shoes. He had tattoos on both of his feet. Really? And, wow, uh, man. I'm, I'm not going that far, yeah. but maybe. And, I'll uh, tattoo some uh, some Chuck Taylors on my feet yeah, so people stop asking go. me if I'm wearing shoes. Uh, but one day he came in and I was like, I had a big backyard at this place and I, I was starting to talk uh, to some friends and contractors about maybe building a live room because what I was really missing was the the band all being in the room together. I, again, like on that Sonic thing, I was I kept going back and listening to the records that I love and like man I can hear the the sweat in the room yeah, you know totally. and my place was like the drummer was in the spare bedroom and the guitar player sat on the toilet and, right the first thing you, you do know. when you're getting into recording you're, is you're like oh I'm I'm supposed to isolate everything yeah absolutely and I I I was really jonesing for that actually I'll say that's that's the second thing you do the first thing you do is you put mics up and you're like and you just do it and it sounds cool yeah. And then later, you the second thing is you isolate everything, and then you discover that it didn't sound. Yeah, your your secondary recordings don't quite sound as good as your first recordings. Yeah, man. But you've got more control. That must be a good thing. Control must be a good thing in the studio, right? Uh, That's why they call it a control room. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, I remember taking my band into the studio, and we were making a record, and I was just going to school at this point, so I was learning all this stuff that was new, and we're sound checking the drums. We we never used to sound check the drums. We just put. But we were lucky if we put mics on it and recorded anything at all. Yeah. Um, but this time now I'm like, I'm listening to the snare mic. I'm like, I hear a ring. I hear a ring in the snare. We better, we got to address that ring. Yeah. Let's let's put an O-ring on the snare, you know? And yeah. I think I'm being a badass. And I mean, it turned out all right in the end, but still it was like, it was those kind of things. Like as an engineer, I feel like you, you have this feeling that you better use these studio tricks because- right. Two reasons. One is because they, they exist, and two is because you feel a whole lot smarter as an engineer if you use them. You know, yeah. Man, in my experience, usually the ring that's that's in the close mics is what's making the room mic sound cool. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So you got to kind of figure it out both ways. You know. Yeah. Sometimes the ring's wrong. Yeah. You don't want a wrong. You want a ring. Yeah. Um, but if it's <laughs> right, it's what makes you know. Um, a black beauty sound like a black beauty. Yeah. Uh, actually, you know, I'll even I'll even mention this because one of the questions listening to your records, you know, I wanted to ask you if you were an Audio Slave fan because I felt Big like time. I was hearing some of that in there too. Big time. Some influences, and I remember, um, oh goodness, I don't know the na- the titles of all the records, but the sort of the breakout Audio Slave record with the flame on the cover that was um, uh, Cochise. Yeah, Cochise, right? Yeah. Exactly. And I remember thinking like the snare on that was like, I'm like, well, there's the golden, you know, golden mean for, for what a snare should sound like for me right now. Absolutely. But man. that's, that kind of thing really has like a combination of like close mics that make the drums sound like they're, you know, you've got a magnifying glass and you're looking at all these instrument sounds, you're listening to them through a magnifying glass. And at the same time, it's got just the right ring to it, and then yeah. you hear the room just right, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that that first Audio Slave record, uh, you know, Soundgarden, Super Unknown. Yeah. Uh, even even for me, like the Black Album, you know, it's like that was a peak time in 
having the big like LA room sound on the drums or whatever, but also an attack and presence and in your face quality that, you know, now we seem to be in this trend of like snares pretty low and thuddy and Mm. um, splatty, which is cool. But for me, it's a lot harder and a lot more rewarding to pull off a drum that's open and, you know, has air around it. And so quick question. I I find sometimes that the direction that sonic trends go in is sometimes no more interesting than, well, what's happening with people's studios and the technology at that time, you know? So when you talk about a, a dead thud on a snare, I kind of have to think, I wonder if that, if that is a result of many more home studios and stuff like that, where it's a lot easier to just kind of make dead drums and tighten it up and, you know, not, and just, and shy away from that. You know, you think of the 1970s sound of all these, these dead sounds on records. Yeah. And, um, I, my theory on that is that you had, you used to have studios that were big, big rooms and you didn't have many tracks to record with. And you were just trying to capture this whole sound together onto limited tracks and then with the uh, introduction of multi-track tape machines and consoles, all of a sudden, again, this, con- this, this idea of control in the studio, you had yeah. like room for a whole lot more control. So, well, you better isolate all the instruments from each other too. And, you know, we're still in a studio with about the same space as the one that had the big room, but now we're just going to divide that room up into lots of little ISO booths. Yeah. You know, and so then you end up with this sound of all these dead instruments and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Maybe you got any thoughts about where sounds are going now and how? Yeah, it's I think a lot of it studios? has to do with the the laptop generation. Uh, I think that you LG. Know, yeah, the, the LG. LG. <laughs> uh, I think that you know a lot of music now is layering samples onto what you've recorded in your home or whatever, and. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but a lot of those samples that I'm hearing tend to be like the the Canon kind of lower thuddy thing. <laughs> yeah, and, and part of that too may be that... Lindrum tuned down. Yeah, every, every generation kind of bucks against what... Whatever happened before, yeah. right? Yeah, the last thing. Yeah, yeah so, and that's okay. Yeah. So I'm just trying to stick around long enough to where... Where it comes back. Where it comes back, and then I'm <laughs> gonna be, circle. I'm, I'm gonna be ready. You'll be like, I'm the guy who didn't sell all my shit when yeah. it wasn't hip anymore. I still got uh, it. Everybody, come on over. That's so funny. Yeah, actually, the uh, that for me, the snare sound of 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 that rock, like aggression, uh, animal kind of vibe, is is really still what turns me on more than any kind of tight programmy yeah sounding thing animal is in yeah yeah exactly muppets um speaking of which do you know matt mahaffey i don't know him but i know i think he played i think he might have been animal really yeah it was uh it was it may have been on conan or something like that there was a or or um well i forgot what show it was but there was a drum off it was like animal versus. I think I remember that. that. I think got to do, got to be animal. That's funny. Behind the man. scenes, of course, you know. Yeah. Every, the world only sees the Muppet. But uh, um, all right. So was, dig it. So I like to ask guests to share an inspirational quote, get us kind of excited about hitting the studio as we kick off the podcast. Do you have anything you want to say that, that gets you pumped for hitting the studio? Well, I it, it might be more just advice than sure. a, a quote. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I'll give you a quote. All right. That, has anybody ever said the comparison is the thief of joy quote on Not here? Not yet. So that's been a big one for me. I can't. I don't even remember who coined the phrase. Comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. That's great. And I think when you're doing an art form like music, where I'm listening to stuff all the time and going to see bands all the time and... Uh, and trying to be aware of your surroundings, but not let them, you know, directly influence you one way or another. Uh, sometimes it's hard to to draw the line between when you're when you're being inspired by things and when you're uh, 
being challenged in an unhealthy way. Yeah. You know, it's like the drive. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I'm aware of this when I'm listening to stuff. Um, I do a lot of listening in the car. So, like, yeah. you know, this is a podcast. So, you might be listening to this in the, po- in the car. Sometimes I listen to stuff and I feel um, it, it lifted up and inspired. And sometimes I I notice myself stressing, like tightening, like yeah. I'm like, oh man, I really should be doing this yeah. or that or the other thing. And and I think that's kind of at the core of that too. And of course, you know, here I am sitting in a chair with a pulled back and um, perhaps the comparison was like, you know, seeing too many of those YouTube videos pop up from, for me now of abs over 40, just yeah. before I go watch whatever <laughs> video I'm looking at, uh, you know, and then I lift a weight too hard and it's, Tried to steal my joy, but I won't let it rock stars. We're still doing the interview today anyway. You know what? Uh, I've found th- the best stuff for me is the record or the live performance or whatever where I I leave and I've experienced both of those things where it it it, tr- it truly inspired me. Yeah. But also it was it was so great and so far from where I'm at that it kind of depresses you in a way too. Yeah. And you got to work through all of that. Yep. My favorite records are like that, you know, because it seems like such an unachievable goal that you can get down, but it's so good that it inspires you to to get back in it, you know? Yeah. And then I, I talk about this on the podcast too, but I think that that part of being an artist and part of this idea of like a record is never finished, it's abandoned, mm-hmm. and part of the... The idea that when you listen to the last thing you did, you're you're never satisfied with it is a good thing because it's at the core of the thing that is our drive that keeps pushing us to try and do something better and better. I mean, it's like if if everything we did we were like perfectly satisfied with, maybe we wouldn't try to do something new next time, you know? Yeah. So I think that can be good. Um I had a thought too. I guess I guess that's the same idea of like you know, this comparison is the thief of joy. Is comparison always external? I mean, sometimes comparing yourself to somebody else or some other record or some other band or some other studio um, can feel like it's, it's, um, it's bringing you down a little bit in this thief of joy idea. But, but what about comparing yourself to yourself, you know, your own, your own work? Do you ever find that like you did, you really nailed something and before, and now you're struggling to get it as good Oh, I think I've gone through that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, I've experienced that when, so when I write with artists or bands, uh, we usually, I, I'm just terrible at demos. I don't know how to do a demo. Awesome. Cause that, to do a demo, you have to say that's good enough. Right. And I've spent my whole life training myself to say it's not good enough. Yeah, you know? I know that feeling. And so usually when I'm, and it feels unfair to the band sometimes because yeah. you're like, you're, they're like, dude, we had 200 bucks to do this. And yeah. you're like, yeah, well, we just need to book another week and we'll, we'll, we'll knock it out. Totally. And, and two, when you're, when you're in a writing uh, thing, usually everybody's kind of giving their time a free in hopes that this becomes something. And so there's that line of like, well, let's get it, let's paint a picture enough where someone can get the picture. But we're all doing this for free. So let's not waste too much time on it. And that's always a really hard area for me. But to answer your question, what I'll do is record really fast and not think about the recording process at all. Let's just get it, get it to a place where we feel something and then move on. And a lot of times we'll come back to do the master recording and be chasing some of the things that, you know, happened in the demo oh, process. Oh, totally know that. Totally where it's know like, that. It, this technically should sound way better now. Why doesn't it? And right. really what it is, is is just emotionally where you're at when you're writing the song. Well, um, we have a little bit of an advantage in that department these days. Although, you know, when I say these days, I mean, I'm rewinding, you know, 15 years, 20 years, we still had The digital it, but, era. But the digital era versus bef- prior to that, because prior to that, you had your demo, and now you're re-recording everything, and your comparison is like, maybe you pull up a DAT mix of that, right. you know, or a CD or something of that demo and play it, and then you go back to what you're doing now, and you're like, eh, what is it? But I, but I do remember struggling through that. Um, so a band had recorded demos, and they had some great, great sounds, Um 
And here we were re-recording it. And, you know, I didn't want to make that error of like, you know, think something's good enough, then come back later and go, oh, crap. So it was nice to be able to take a guitar tone that was really killing, put it on a track in Pro Tools and put it right next to your new one. And then you just keep listening. You're like, we're not there yet. We're not there. Okay, now we're there. Or now this sounds a little better than that. And that can be helpful. It doesn't mean that we ultimately made a better sounding finished thing, right. but um, but at least for those details along the way, it's nice to have that like easy ability to compare a track to yeah. another. Well, now for me, like it just has challenged me to to really never think about anything in a demo way because you know I just had a record come out this year that uh, one of the lead vocals was the vocal from when we wrote the song. Yeah, and you know, thankfully we took our time to at least set up a decent, you know, chain for the voice. And then it ended up staying on the record. Is that one that you can tell us about that's in our YouTube playlist? uh, I can't remember what I sent you, but. um, Yeah. I don't have the list right off the top of my head, but. um, That's it. It's a track called East Side Restaurant off of a artist named Caitlin Smith. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we do have a Caitlin. Uh, we have Starfire. Starfire. Playlist, that's yeah. the lead single off the record. Yeah, that's great. Um, um, so Rockstar is just a reminder. Of course, I, I threw together a YouTube playlist of um, a bunch of Paul's records that just sound great that he shared with us. So if you click through into the show notes, you'll see that there. And that's a great way to just kind of reference some of the stuff we're talking about. See, it's the easiest share these days yeah. is YouTube. So yeah. hopefully that won't be like, you know, sound like ancient history when you guys listen to this podcast 10 years from now. <laughs> um, we'll dig it. So yeah, I mean, I, I've experienced that too. And there are so many intangible things that happen in, um, you know, the vocal recording process where, you know, we, we might've demoed a vocal and it, and we're trying to figure out like why we can't get a cool thing now when we're super intentional and we're quote in the studio versus right. that, the thing that was done demoed in the apartment way back when. And then it was like, well, I, you know, maybe I used to record the vocals in the hallway and it had wooden panel walls and maybe that was part of the sound. And, you know, ultimately I think you, you get to a point where you're like, stop trying to control it. You know, yeah. again, that, that, it's that, that control idea. thing, like you're not going to do it. You're just going to, it, that is what it was. And then what we're doing today is what it is. Yeah. And you just, you always kind of deliver your best version of where you're at now. And if the demo vocal beats what we spend a bunch of time working on today, if you're smart, that's okay. Yeah. Well, you it goes back to one, that, right? that quote of comparison. Even, you know, I, I meant that when I first said it in terms of like comparing yourself to other people in the music business and, you know, whatever. But now that I think about it, even when I work, I don't I don't really spend a whole lot of time chasing anything other than the vision of the song. And so uh you know one of my heroes is Brendan O'Brien and yeah. I've gone to the end of the internet, you know, to find out information about everything about how he made some of my favorite records and and kind of the theme of of anyone that's ever worked with him is like man the two things is he gets the sound right at the source. So it's got to be right coming out of the guitar amp or yeah. when you hit the drum. And then he doesn't fuss about a lot of stuff. It's like drum sounds on some of my favorite records, you know, from Pearl Jam to Stone Temple Pilots or whatever, they got in less than 10 minutes, you know? Wow, yeah. And, uh, and his thing is like, really, it's the song... And it's the performance. Those I mean, technically, two. Rockstars, it was nine minutes and 59 seconds. Yeah. So, like, just don't take it too far. But Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I love that. And and getting sounds right at the source is one of those things that's hard to do, especially at the beginning, because you don't know. You don't know what, yeah. what the sound of something is supposed to sound like. I remember one of the first times I heard, I knew a great guitar player in St. Louis, Obad Khan, who actually makes my blue Khan mic pre that we're using for our voices right now. Oh, wow. Um, but... I saw him play a show, you know, as many years ago, and he had a vintage Strat, and he was playing through an AC30, and he had just, just some of the right pedals, and it was this amazing tone. And I went up afterwards, and I was like, and I asked him about it. And he was like, "Yeah, he just handed me the guitar. He's like, "Yeah, here, try it out." And I played it for a second. I was like, "Oh, that's what, that's what that sounds like coming out of the amp." Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think that 
you know, you just have to be in front of those experiences. Um, trial and error can get you there very slowly sometimes. Yeah. But, um, you know, like what does a drum set that's going to, with the right drummer, sound like coming out, you know, if you walked into the room and stood in front of the drum set, which is usually what your experience is when you are trying to like, you know, set up the drums. Yeah. But what does that sound like in that space before you even go and listen in the speakers in the control yeah. room? Or, you know, the guitar amp or the bass that's so great. You know, and then there are those times where you're like, you know, you read about, you know, I remember reading about Michael Beinhorn cutting the bass um, for Marilyn Manson. And it was like, they talked about this, you know, this 810 cabinet in a small room and it was turned up so loud that that it was compressing the room. Yeah. And you're like, you can't really stick your head in there to listen at that point. So then you're like, is is the right tone at the source something that's sort of like, uh, overly extreme, but by the time it comes through the microphone and through the speakers, it's uh-huh. just right, you know. So, well, it, and you know, I you simplify saying a oh, drum sounds took me- ten minutes and he gets it right at the source. But what you're what you're not saying when you say that is, oh yeah, and the three hundred records he made before right. that day, right? And the fact that the ten minutes that it took to get drum sounds is because they had the drummer from Audio Slave playing a vintage Ludwig kit going through, you know, a Neve console. It's like all that stuff does yeah. add up. It's Maybe not even hitting it as hard as you think it, he's hitting it. Right. Um, but, so it's not just because they had great catering? Yeah. At the session? yeah. <laughs> uh, man, I would love to do a record that had catering. <laughs> I've been a well, part of one or two, but it's been a long, long time. So I'll describe our version of catering. So what I, um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to um, work with interns over over years, and and I, I love doing that. I love the the interaction of like you know teaching and, and yeah. working with people who are trying to be around all the music. And um, one of the things that we try and do is is that, um, if I'm in the studio, I like to be very very efficient about time, um, and so I don't. You know, I know if if I'm working with an independent client that it's a big investment for, for them. And a lot of times somebody who's in the studio uh, only occasionally views a lunch as an imposition as yeah. opposed to like normal part of the day. And so what we'll do is is uh, I'll ask the intern to like go around and just get everybody's taco orders or something and, um, you know, go drive and just have lunch just appear magically right between two takes. Nice. That, that's always a good way to do it. Of course, we live in an age now. I mean, I mentioned Uber Eats before. Yeah. Um, you know, any of these delivery things, I've started doing that a little bit more. And that is kind of a great way. It's a little bit more pricey, but it's a great way to just, you know, be in your session and just have food arrive at the right timing without disrupting anything. It feels like catering. Yeah. Or the you know, the best one for me was... Uh, I worked with a band one time that had a female lead singer that loved to cook. And at the beginning of the record, she went, we took uh, a portion of the the budget, which would have been less than what it would cost for us to go out to eat every day. And she went to the grocery store and, and every morning would come in. And while I'm working on getting the band track together, she'd get the food started. We had these amazing lunches and it was like, kind of cohabitation vibe, you know, and it made for a really different recording experience. Like we never left the studio and it was kind of amazing. Yeah. You know? I like doing that. And, and, um, if you can get that going, that's a good way to do it. It's yeah. fun to camp out in the studio. I've done sessions certainly where we camp out and it's all day, all night affair and, you know, yeah. you sleep and you wake up and you do it again. Um, I don't do that regularly now because I'm trying to, for sustainability at this point in my life, I find it's nice to have work hours and then yeah, you know, taxing non-work on your hours body. and stuff. And, and when you have family and kids and stuff, a lot yeah. of that can change too. Well, I've found too, the older you get, you know, when you start out, there is a portion of your life that you're supposed to obsess over exactly, something yeah. and eat, drink, sleep, it, you know, to yeah. the, to the, to the end of yourself, you know, and, and we kind of all in this business had that season of our lives. I feel like I described that as our graduate school. Yeah, for you don't sure. get a diploma for it, but um, that's where you put in all that time—the ten thousand hours to mastery—and you learn, learn, learn. Yep. 
you know, all these ways to deal with so many things. And it's okay if a lot of what you recorded at that time sounds shitty. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that's, that's what that time you're is You're supposed for. to experience all these, you know. I think you get to a point, though, where the, uh, the, the, the healthier thing to do creatively is to spend time outside of the studio so that you take in life experiences that can yeah. influence the way that that you operate when you do go in. Which is also how you started because when you start out, you're you're a kid or you're whatever, 20s or whatever yeah. age you're at and it's just life and then you're getting some chances to go record and play music and and all that is influenced creatively by your life experiences. Yeah. But I agree with you. I, I actually, hearing you say it like that, I see the reflection of those times where we would spend seven days in the studio and we would, I'd learn a ton about the craft of making records but I would utterly lose perspective on the creative process. So like, are we making anything that's even worth listening to? Right. You know, are we, are we doing any good work? And I think that that is kind of a normal, you know, chapter of making records and it's okay. Yeah. You know, we both talked about running before we started the podcast. A big thing for me when I wrap up mixes on a record and uh, if I were to take them and immediately listen at my house or in the car or whatever. At that point, you've kind of lost some amount of perspective. And I've found that when I leave the studio, it'll say I've mixed two songs that day or three songs on the record that I'm working on. If I go home and immediately listen to them, the things that I will catch at that moment will not be as great as if I don't listen to it. I go home what I do is I put it on my phone the next morning I'll get up and I'll run to it and I hear everything right because you've got clarity of yeah. having a good night's sleep you're exercising you're doing something different where your brain isn't you're not sitting in front of two speakers it's more passive listening and to me that informs me because the things that stick out really stick out at that point and I and I'm fresh enough to take them in so Really, the only hardest part is just remembering because I can't write stuff down while I'm running, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Wow. Uh, yeah, you know. So for me, I haven't done it uh, running, but I but I do the same thing in the car. And, I, and I'm always thinking about, like, what's the easiest way to take notes yeah. in that <laughs> in that moment? And what I describe is, like, it's, it's what your subconscious picks up on quickly and relevantly when your conscious mind is kind of occupied. So sure. if you're driving around town, you're listening, your conscious mind is driving and your subconscious is like picking up on all these cues. And it's like, dude, you need to do this. But I can never figure out a really good way to take notes. And so at one point I actually decided I just need to have two phones, the phone that is Bluetooth into my stereo. So I'm listening. And then a spare second phone that I just press record in and say notes into. Wow. I think, you know, rock stars, honestly, you could probably something like that. Cause you know, you could just, verbally say your notes into a little recorder app yeah. or you could have a, one of those digital recorders, you know, and just put your notes in there and listen back later. Yeah. That's um, awesome. But, but I think that's key. If you can come up with a, a system of allowing yourself to um, have that experience, but then, then take notes somehow. Yeah. But then, you know, um, remembering a, uh, in interview with Jack White once that I read where he talked about songwriting and he said, nah, I don't really record the songs that I'm writing, I just keep coming back. I figure if they're good, they're sticking with me. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting too. That's a good point. Because I lose things quickly. But I do have songs that stick with me too. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. All right. Well, so um, Rockstars, let's take a break now for just a sec. We'll come back in for the jam session and, and we're going to dig into some uh, some real in the studio questions and talk about making some of these great records with Paul. Um, so a reminder that you'll find links to what we're talking about in the show notes on your mobile device. Just look there and uh, you can click through the blog post or, you know, and get to the YouTube playlist and listen to this stuff. And then also a reminder that if you are, you know, kind of digging into mixing and, and you want, you're looking for some of the basics on learning mixing, I do have a free mixing course called mixmasterbundle.com and it's just you get to download my multi-tracks and, and I show you how to mix in any DAW using free and stock plugins and just show you some great tips there. So go check that out if you want. We'll see you in just a minute for the jam session.
You've already invested in your studio speakers, headphones, and treatment of the room. And you're passionate about creating great music, but your mixes don't seem to translate to the rest of the world. The reason is that your speakers and headphones are not telling you the whole story. The frequency response of your studio has huge peaks and valleys all throughout the low end that are completely screwing up your perspective. You may be doing your best to hit the bullseye with your mix, but your room makes the target of a perfect mix impossible to find. Wouldn't it feel great if there was a simple tool that could fix all that for you and help you get your mixes right the first time? Introducing Sonarworks Reference 4, the affordable solution to correcting your speakers and headphones in your studio. Built for Windows and Mac, Sonarworks helps you position your speakers, correct your control room imperfections, and get a million dollar sound on a home studio budget. Get a 21 day free trial at sonarworks.com and start your journey toward the perfect mix. Are you using a Mac in your recording studio? Are you tired of feeling like the studio setup you worked so hard to create is becoming obsolete too quickly? Wouldn't it feel great to have a trusted friend to help you keep your existing Mac and studio setup current and relevant so that you can focus on the thing you love most, which is making great music? Well, now you can rely on OWC, Other World Computing, which you can find at OWC.com, whose mission it is to help you get the most mileage out of your existing Mac. Whether you need to upgrade your RAM, install an SSD drive, add more connectivity, or simply find a great used Mac that's ready to rock, OWC will help take your studio into the future with a vast library of DIY install videos, 24-7 friendly support, and free shipping in the U.S. on most items over $49. Why get frustrated and ditch your existing computer when you can take your studio into the future with OWC? Learn more at OWC.com and find out how awesome your Mac can be at OWC. Hey, rock stars! We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Paul Moak from the Smokestack Studio. You're not really from your studio, but your <laughs> studio is part of you, right? It's like the Beatles. I'll just live there. Yeah, you from, know? from Liverpool. Yeah. No, Paul's not from Liverpool, but he's making records that good. Didn't they all live in a house? Or that was just a movie help, right? Oh yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And they got chased around a lot. I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we're going to jump into some some more questions, some of the jam session questions, but also we're just going to dig into, you know, how Paul's making these great records. So you ready, ready to hit the jam session? Let's do it. Sweet, man. Um, Goodbye June, a wonderful artist you work with, uh, has a great rock sound, big guitars. Sometimes like it sounds like the vocals are almost fuzzy a little bit. And um, you you still, I felt like you still managed to expand on the chorus where the chorus gets bigger but it didn't get louder and it didn't hurt my ear like I'm used to doing. Good. Um, what are some great ways to do this? How can you take a, a rock band thing and get bigger in the chorus, but not kind of like break the machine that, that makes it all work? Sure. Well, you know, everything that I'm going to tell you probably for the rest of the podcast is someone else's, you know, stuff that I've just picked off over the years. Awesome. But, um, you know, I, I learned about vocal doubling from Butch Vig, who learned about it from John Lennon. You know, it's nice. like you just follow the trail back. John Lennon, who but, apparently hated doubling his vocals. Yeah. Well, and that's the argument that Butch used with uh, Kurt Cobain. It's like, well, John Lennon hated it too, but you love the Beatles records, you know. You <laughs> so uh, that's one way, and it, especially with Goodbye June, was uh, when the chorus comes in, you know, double track guitars, uh, doubled vocals on the the lead, um, sometimes doubled harmonies, um, just to give you that stereo. So it's almost like more of the same. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, with a band like that, not being real precious about how tight the the double is, mm -hmm. you know, just doing it and and you know, obviously they're a good enough band that, uh, the doubled guitars, uh, are, are in sync enough to where when you spread them out, it just sounds like one massive, you know, thing. So in the verse, might you have guitars kind of panned hard left and panned right? 
Yeah, there's two two guitarists in the band, so typically on a song, you you know, they'd each have their part, and then the chorus, the guy that plays more the um, you know, the Malcolm Young role in the band, we double his rhythm guitar, mm-hmm. and then the other guy that plays the lead, maybe uh, it would be more up up the center with the lead vocal, um, the lead guitar double wood or something like that or just the oh, lead d- guitar d- so we'd have the doubled rhythms you know on each side and then the lead part would be on its own i see so the the rhythm guitar players you're you're recording him on the left and you're doubling it on the right for the verse maybe or for the chorus for the chorus yeah. so in the, in the verse maybe it might the guitars are itself. panned left and right and then when the chorus hits you take the rhythm guitar Double it on the right, and now take the the other guitar player and just kind of move it to the middle and yeah. bring it up. Maybe you're doubling those lead parts as well, or it just depends sometimes. On what. Sometimes it depends on if it's like a hook for sure. Um, Do you want to talk a little bit um, about some of the things you remember about what made those guitar tones great? What you know, right right from the guitar through any favorite pedals or amps, or like how you how do you go about it, miking the guitars and sure. recording them? Well, I remember specifically with that band, uh, Tyler, the lead guitar player, is just a fantastic, world class musician. And uh, but one thing that was unique that we did on that record is we had uh, permanent guitar setups for both players, so that you know we might swap a pedal or a guitar here, but we wanted to have distinct sounds for both of them that that kind of carried across the whole album. So we picked, uh, Tyler, Tyler had, I think a bad cat that, that was his sound. That's and, his amp, right? Uh huh. Yeah. And so I paired that with another amp, uh, from my collection just to kind of give us more tonal options. And, and so we'd mic both amps and then depending on the part might bring out more of, the bad cat or there's the, there's the espresso machine yeah. shutting down in the background. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing I've run into sometimes with guitar amps is sometimes you can have an amp that's doing a cool thing, but if you're cho- if it's got the wrong speaker cone in it, it can sound real mid rangey and oh, honky. Yeah, like I've got sure. a silver tone. I can't even remember what the speaker is in there, but, um, but I remember not liking it that much. Is there, are there any speaker cones that are, you want to, you know, give a shout out to that, that yeah. go well for something like that? Well, I mean, in the rock world, you're never going to go wrong with some vintage thirties. Um, I'm a huge fan of the, the Vox blue. Um, uh, what was the name of them? It's what's in the AC 30. Um, oh, the blue bulldogs. Yeah. Yeah. I love those speakers. But do but, they only pair well with a Vox amp? Yeah. You can't, you're not going to plug a, a Marshall head through them, you yeah. Know. And the vintage thirties are made by uh, Celestians. Celestians, okay, yeah, great, yeah. And uh, vintage thirties and Greenbacks are my two favorite. Yeah, I remember Celestians. that from doing a lot of rock stuff. And so what we what we have at the studios, uh, we kind of have all the cabs in in a room, going to a patch bay that I made that is a speaker patch bay. So you got. You got to know what you're doing because you don't want to blow up an amp. And right, so let the rock stars know what are some classic ways mistakes you can make that will blow up an amp. Well, if 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 the amp has tube circuitry, uh, and and you put a put that amp under a load without having anywhere for that power to go, if you don't have it plugged into a speaker cabinet, mm-hmm. uh, then you can blow a transformer. Um, the hopefully, transformer. So we're talking about we're not talking about a combo amp, although you could be if you disconnect the speaker sure. from from the amp inside the combo. But Rockstar's, if you've got an an amp head and a speaker cabinet that's second, uh, yeah, that's external, and you don't have the speaker plugged in, and you've got that amp on, you can fry out that that output transformer. Have you yeah. ever seen that happen? Oh yeah, really. Yeah, so yeah. how long does it take? You know, like how how long of a mistake do you have to make? To fry something like uh, that, you know, I don't know because the one time I saw it was a, a back when I was touring live, and someone just didn't plug in. The, oh, and they had the amp on for yeah. a little while or something. Uh, like that. I have, I have personally fried an amp. It was a Fender, I think it was a Bassman, or maybe a Bandmaster. I can't remember, but uh, it's gone now. Yeah, yeah, plugged it into a uh, four twelve cabinet, 
that the there's there, so there's a couple of things you got to be concerned with. Ohm rating is the first, and that's the easiest. You want the amp's ohm rating to match the speaker cabinet, and there's a little bit of math involved, which gets scary, you know, because yeah. you got to add, uh, you got to figure out what the total ohm rating of all the speakers is. Yeah, well, if you're lucky, it's somebody wrote it on the back. Of exactly. The cabinet. <laughs> but if they uh, didn't, then it's all about whether the speakers are wired in serial or in parallel correct. In, inside the speaker cabinet. And now, I think, can you measure it? Like, if you're not sure, can you just plug a cable in and put an ohm meter across it? And will it show you eight ohms or I don't 16 know. ohms or, you know, four ohms? I, that would be awesome. Yeah, I can't remember whether that's true or not. So, but we'll have to find that one out. And Rockstars, the, if you're listening to this and you want to drop a comment into the YouTube video, yeah. please do. Let us know what you think. They're like, you guys are so dumb. It's just, you <laughs> that's what look we're at here the for. two speakers and you add them up. No. And then the other is the total wattage that the the speakers are pulling out of the amp. You know, you don't want to, and that's where I blew up an amp one time was the, uh, I can't remember what the wattage was of right. the if cabinet. Right, if you plug in a 100-watt head into a vintage 30, that's a 30-watt speaker, right? Right. So you're going to fry that thing pretty quickly if it's all alone. Yeah, and <laughs> if you got it cranked up. So uh, anyway, I don't even remember how we got it. Oh, well, well, so, I, so the, all of our cabs are loaded with different uh, tonal options because yeah. it's just another thing that – uh, so the cabs are plugged into your patch bay, and then in the, in the control room, you can take that head and just move the speaker cable from one correct patch point to another, and it's going to hit a different cab, which right. you prob which maybe you've got them all mic'd up out there so you can hear them easily. Exactly. But then Rockstars, if you do the takeaways from the ohm thing is when you are turning on an amp, always look in the back, double check that that head is plugged into a speaker camp before speaker cab yeah. <laughs> before you flip on the amp and start using it. And two, if you're going to switch speakers while that while you're using that head, that's totally fine. Just always turn on the standby switch, yep. unplug the speaker, go plug into another one. Yeah. And so, like, if I'm doing guitars here, I might have I don't have a um, the luxury of multiple speaker cabinets. I've got one out there, but I might have the luxury of a multiple few different heads. heads, and they can all be on and warmed up. But they should all be in standby until you want to try one out, yep. try one out, and then plug in the speaker cable. Take it off standby. Give it a listen. Yeah, and you know there there's different. Um, everyone's got an opinion. You can go uh, out of a eight ohm head into a sixteen ohm right. cab. Uh, I've always been under the the mindset that in the tube world, as long as you're just one generation away from uh, the ohm rating, then you're you mean like safe. an eight up to the next, which would be a sixteen, or Correct. an eight down to a four? But but don't go from a four to a thirty-two, you know, or whatever. Man, I don't think I've ever even seen a thirty-two. Yeah, uh, but I will say, you know, it typically usually sounds the best when you got them matched correctly. Yeah. Well, I know that um, speaker cabinets can sound quite different from each other, and that's very eye-opening. I've got a few options here. And when I took the time to just take the same heads and try some different ones out, like I totally discovered that the one that was no name brand that I picked up from some music store sounded way better than the ones like my Silvertone cab yeah. or like this trainer cab I had. Um, and it was, you know, it was like, wow, that, that one really sounds great. So now that's the default one I use. And, yeah. and like so many things in the studio, you won't know until you stumble on it and then you have to make a mental note. That's the one that sounds best yep. and go to that one. Um, dig it. All right. Now, what about miking up um, guitar cabinets? How do you get a great rock guitar tone? And we also haven't talked about tape yet. Maybe we yeah, should talk man. a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, miking, miking wise, I tend to favor close mic guitar cabs. So anywhere from two inches to eight inches away from the cab. Um, I, you know, I challenge anyone to find something better than a 57, you know, yeah. I'll usually pair that with another mic. Uh, what do you, what are some good pairings? For you? Uh, I love the Sennheiser 409. I think okay, they make the dynamic. 609 now. Uh, but um, how would you describe the difference in those tones of a 57 and a, and the 409? The 57 is always going to give you that, mid-range thing that 
you need in the electric guitar to poke right. out in the right. mix. The 409, uh, especially on like a closed back cabinet, it's going to give you that tight bottom end. Yeah. Um, uh, I've done ribbons too. Uh, um, I Do actually you, like the Blue Dragonfly. Oh, that, really? Uh, condenser. Condenser mic. Yeah. That's a great guitar cab mic. Um, I remember one of the first times I discovered a dual miking technique was again. It was I think it was from Butch Fig when we were up yeah. at, at um a let, uh, excuse me up, up at Smart Sounds, and we did a fifty seven with a um, a FET forty seven next to it. Wow! And it was like that combination with compression. The FET forty seven brought in what I call the the low end rush. Yeah. So like you you play the chord, and when you're muting. There's like a, a good distorted, you know, um, four four twelve cab will have this, yeah, you know, like that's deep and makes it all sound big and powerful, guttural, yeah, guttural, yeah. And so like that helps kind of bring that forward. Yeah. Whereas the fifty seven by itself will give you the mid range, but you you might be missing out on some of that a little bit, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it's true. I mean, a fifty seven is like a great go to. Like if that's what you got. Don't sweat it. You got enough to make a great record. Yeah, for sure. But it's a lot of fun to start adding in these second ones. So when you start adding a mic, what's some of the stuff that people need to be aware of? How do you, uh, where do you put it? Yeah. Where do you put either of these mics? The For me, like the the magic spot for me is if you're looking at the speaker and you have the, the cone and then the center, mm-hmm. uh, right where the center meets the 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 inside edge of the cone is where I like to start. So it's kind of the brightest spot, isn't it? Yeah, and then as you move you move outward, it gets darker. Interesting, um, yeah. And to me, uh, I don't. This that's the good starting place, you know. And I, I've usually I'll stick the mics both in the same spot. I, I tend to not right next to each other. Not right? mic. If there's two speakers in the cabinet, I'll pick my favorite um, and just mic that one. What are some ways that you determine that one is your favorite? Uh, just by ear. Just get in front of this yeah. thing and listen. Yeah, you know, that's the, that's what interns are for, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've definitely, there's, there's going to be no substitute for just getting in there and taking the pain for a second. Yeah, you know? so... Um, but fa- Gosh, phase is the that. thing that Leor Gold- Goldenberg. I think when we were talking on the podcast, I think he talked about um, how that that moment of choosing and and getting the guitar tone. It's like it's a really critical time, and you sometimes you need to remind the guitar player, "I really need you to just play that one power chord over and over." I know yeah. it's boring and it sucks, but that's the only way that I can hear coming out of the amp that thing that is going to be what's actually in the song. Yeah. And then not only that, but when I go out there to give a listen, I've got about like three seconds of good listening time before my ears blown out. Yeah. Cause it's so loud. So I really need you to like, you know, don't, don't be doodling around on like your, your some jazz lick you've been learning yeah. or whatever. It's the same with drums, man. Yeah. Exact same with drums. I found that, um, uh, you tell a drummer to play and and they start playing something that's outside of the song. Yeah. And it just, it works against what you're dialing in. Yeah. So that's why I try to not have any technical, uh, that's why you want, when, when you have the talent coming in, whether it's a band or an artist or whatever, if, if you know that they're, uh, the the energy that they're going to bring that 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 is a drainable thing right you know? and so you want to be able to get your sounds quickly and not belabor them so i try to have everything technically kind of figured out before band gets in where the drum sounds don't take a long time because we already checked through the mics right you already line check yeah I find I do, let's see, what are the things that I do beforehand? I, I would set up mics and I would line check them to make sure everything's working, but I save level uh-huh. setting and I save phase checking for the actual drummer. Yeah. Mostly it's because if I have an intern, they suck at drums anyway, just like I do. And you can't really tell what's, yeah. you can't really tell. But um, is that sound about right for you? What are some things that you find you can repeatedly set up for the drums before the drummer's in there? 
Uh, yeah, d- definitely line check. For me, the biggest thing, it doesn't matter whether it's drummer, singer, anything, is making sure the headphones sound good before they get there. Yeah. You know? Um, okay, so um, if you don't have drum sounds yet, how do you make sure the headphones sound good? Well, at least, at least uh, this might be... This might be just for me because I'm working in my environment, mm-hmm. but we we have some things that we know we always do that we make sure are in place, whether it's like uh, levels on the drums, even though we haven't set them yet, we kind of know you what- ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for a singer, we know, let's have a good slap back and a reverb ready to go in the box so yeah. that- when they ask for it, it's like two seconds away, yeah. you know? Um, and some of that stuff's just a luxury because we get to stay in our own environment. Uh, I, I guess the takeaway being what you don't want is someone that loses passion for the song because they've, they've played it so many times while you were dinking around with a yeah. preamp or a compressor or whatever. Um, and I would, I would also suggest that if Dinking around with stuff for a long time feels like it's just a necessary part of the process for you rock stars. Try and separate that by a big chunk of time exactly. from the actual recording. You know, exactly. do it the night before, the day before, and then come back in fresh. I love multiple tracking days where it's like you come back in on the second day and you fire everything up and it's like everything's there and the bands, everybody knows what they're hearing and they just get creative and it's like, that first song just comes out of the gate so fast, hopefully. Yeah. Sort of a bummer when you're the engineer and then the producer's like, oh yeah, so on this one we want to do, and you're like, yeah. oh damn, couldn't we just do a song that kind of sounds like the one we just did? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, that's a good tip is like kind of pairing stuff together sound-wise. Yeah. Um, and if you're engineering and you've got a producer that's you know trying to chase these visions, empower them with an understanding of your process so that you you let them know like, Hey, if we're going to do a multi mic drum thing, we should stick to that and try and maybe put those together. Because a lot of times the producer's probably just thinking about like vibe and uh-huh. they're thinking about tempo. And they think of these songs as being very different, you know, where as the engineer or the studio, you might think about those songs as being quite similar and right. needing to be paired up together. It's good. And two, you know, also understanding that. From the producer's side, maybe abandoning the multi mic mic drum setup and going with the song that's completely opposite in terms of the engineering part of it is where the record needs to go. And you kind of got to let go of the reins because sometimes the producer might be thinking about the, the artist's headspace and kind of preserving energy. I know a mm-hmm. big part for me is just like making sure that no matter what we're doing, we're moving in a forward direction. Right. And so if we're getting bogged down in one thing, maybe totally switching gears to get some new energy in the room and and get everybody excited again. Yeah. Because you know? it is, it can become a belaboring process. You it's know? The, the source. It's always get it right yeah. at the source. And if the source is the energy of the artist, you got no choice but to go there. Yeah. For sure. You got to follow everything. Everything else got to follow. So I wanted to mention also Craig Alvin, another guest on the show. Yeah. Um, he talked about, you know, some of the early sessions he did where he was, he had a specialty where he would come in and he would like dial in the drum kit and get the sounds and actually like play the drums in an appropriate way for the song so that when the artist would sit down and start playing, you know, the drummer, it, it already fit pretty wow. well. So I thought that was kind of a cool way of doing it too. But if you're going to do that, you got to have that that understanding of drumming and and you know the the confidence to know that you're setting up something that like that that is the way you want the drums to be in the song and if the drummer is not playing it right, you know they they may have to adjust their playing too. Yeah. So it's I a think it also act. depends on whether it's a band or an artist that you're bringing in session players or or uh kind of what role the drums play in the bigger picture. Yeah. Cause a lot of times they're, they're not always the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't tell the drummer. Uh, a lot of times, man, I, if it's a solo artist that I'm working with, we might already have the whole drum kit picked. Like I'll pick out what the drums should be. 
and have it already set up and just tell the drummer like, hey, this is what you're playing today. Whereas if it's a band, I might m- rely more on their band gear, what they're comfortable with. Um, you know, session guys right. tend to be able to walk in and kind of adapt to the situation. Whereas, yeah. uh, you know, a guitar player in a band, you take away his guitar and his amp and that might be 99% of his confidence, you know? Right. So you try to be sensitive to to each musician and their needs. You know, that's an interesting thing. So, um, maybe talk about that a little bit more. Talk about those times with bands where it's appropriate to, you know, hand them one of your 10 guitars in the studio yeah. or try a different amp versus the times where you're like, you know, maybe you did that. Maybe you handed them a great guitar amp combo and they're like, this is fucking, this is rocks, you know? Yeah. But then later you're like, oh my God, what did I do? I steered this record in some weird direction that doesn't really equal them. Yeah. Well, part of that is, you know, having your own recording space and, you know, I've got all these different options. Sometimes the best thing to do is limit ourselves and pretend like they're not there. Yeah. Because. Like plugins. <laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, could don't even get me started on computers. It's like, just because we have the technology available doesn't mean we should use it. I think that getting older and kind of realizing um, more of the craft of pulling greatness out of people is all built on limitations. Yeah. You know, and you know, some of, if you look at records like Elliot Smith or, you know, the artists that took what they had and kind of adapted to making a record based off of a limited, you know, whether it's, I only have three mics or whatever, then what becomes great about it is what comes out of you. Yeah. And and to me, that's what I'm more interested in now because we have, we're in this great age where we can sound like anything at any time, you know? Yeah. Uh, because of computers and and you can take a really, really crappy song and make it sound like a million bucks, but it's still a crappy song. Yep. So... For me, in my environment, it's it's about when a band walks in saying, okay, we might have all this stuff around us, but let's start with with what you guys have. Let's start with the synth you know, the synthesis of your sound and then see how far that can take us. Or, you know, maybe you're getting off the ground. It's like, well, the other guitar player, his tone really isn't cutting it. Let's mm-hmm. work on that. Yeah. You know. Uh, I think there are those times where your your instinct, you know, when you're listening to the speakers, you're like, I hear where this is trying to go, but I just know it can be better, you know? Yeah. Um, some of the the most common, let's talk about some of those, actually, the most common situations where this this thing is causing the guitar tone to not be as good as it can be. So for me, a very common one when a band comes in that is mostly having an experience playing live is that they come in with a big old pedal board yep. and they're going through 12 pedals and maybe one of them is even on and and the amp volume is down too low yep. and the pedals are up too high, you know? And then I, I, I have learned to recognize that. Now, there are times where that is the definition of what's cool. Like right. you, there's an indie quality to that or, or like a treated quality that you can't get unless you pedal the shit out of it. Right. But, um, but I find a lot of times I'm like, Hey, um, do you mind if we try something like, you know, what happens if we just bypass all that? Like, which ones are you using? Right. Can we go only through those pedals and, or what happens if we bypass that and go straight to the amp? Yeah. And, um, you know, there's just, there's a tone, there's a, uh, clarity of tone that only comes from like minimal stuff. Kind Absolutely. Of the amp, think, right? And, you know, it took me being a live guy for so long, it took me a while to divorce myself from the, the pedal board mentality where now at the studio, we just have pedals laying around and, and you grab what you need when you need it. And uh, I understand coming from that world, uh, these, the, the, it's the Linus safety blanket, you know, right. for the guitar player. What I try to do is just encourage them to like, man, 
I promise when you hear this back through the speakers, it's going to blow your mind. You yeah. know, I, we're um, really talking about distortion. Yeah, because that's the place where it fa- where pedals fail the soonest. Um, and you know, getting the drive out of the tubes and the amp might be really yeah. the tone you're looking that for. That and just the attack of the string attack of the guitar yeah. plugged straight in, um, or through a minimal setup. It's just hard to, you know. So let's record your tone and then let's listen to ACDC or listen to, you know, Guns N' Roses or whatever it is. And you'll hear that attack and that, that thing that we're missing. Um, but also so many classic records, the guitar, um, tones are like wispier and thinner and fuzzier than, than, than you ever remember them. Yeah. You know, you go, I like, I was, we were down at Muscle Shoals and listening to, to Dwayne Allman solos and stuff like that. And I'm listening, I'm like, man, that's the tiniest little guitar doing yeah. a blues lick in there. It sounds like a, it sounds like the high E is like an eight. You yeah. Know? That's so And funny, it's like, man. but your memory of it will be this big, big thing, you yeah. know? Your ears deceive you, man. A lot of, you listen to that ACDC stuff, it's a lot cleaner than... Yeah. Like the guitars aren't oversaturated. Yeah, and the know? and the energy and the attitude comes from the hands yeah. and the performance of it more than from, you know, the the infinite sustained tone of yeah. something. That's so um true. okay, so pedals is one place. Tuning. Tuning, great. Talk about tuning, man. Talk about where guitars fail on Well, on mo- most bands don't have their guitars set up the way that we do in the studio. And you know, you're also dealing with you're traveling the guitars in and out of temperatures. No, they're like, know. I got it set up. And it was like yeah. five months ago at yeah. some mom and pop guitar store. And you've and you've been in since then it's been in a hundred degree trailer and a thirty degree venue every night. You Dropped know? from an airplane. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of times uh we might tonally be there and have a great sound, but it's just not in tune. And for me, I'll, I'll wrestle with the guitar to a certain extent and then just be like, man, let's try this. We might have to adjust the tone a little bit, but it's going to get us further down the track if we just quit wrestling with this right now and come back, you know, let's maybe take this and get it set up. Or uh, Well, it's funny because sometimes – you can think something's not working with the guitars and it just turns out to be intonation. Yeah, absolutely. And then like, so I've learned how to intonate guitars, just the basics, the basics. Yeah. Like I don't ever um, start messing with the truss rod and changing the, the neck, but I'm, I won't hesitate to grab a guitar and, you know, find a flathead or a Phillips head and, and start adjusting the bridge saddles. Yeah, me too. Um, and rock stars, we've talked about it before on the podcast, but, uh, you know, it never gets old. Right. Yeah. So intonation on a guitar, you've got a string, it's yay long. It's the, you know, the low E string or the, the low A string there. Um, and as you play it open, most guitar players will play the open string and then look at the tuner and go and watch the, you know, little light going and go, okay, it says it's in the A's in tune. And then they go to play a part and they're halfway up the neck fretting notes. And um, if you take your finger and go up to the 12th fret, which is um, technically meant to be halfway Mm -hmm. across the string and you fret there, it should be dividing the string in half. So now the the string is half as long as the original string. And so therefore it should be an octave higher. And so typically that's where you go check the intonation of a guitar is when you fret that 12th fret you you play it and you look at the tuner again and that tuner should say that's a, you know an e or an a right in tune at that note but if it's sharp or flat that means that it's not really where the fret is landing is not halfway up the string it's a little further than halfway or it's not quite halfway um and so that's what moving the bridge saddle back and forth to the left and the right does mm-hmm. is it actually changes the length length of the string which means that that 12th fret is hitting the string in a slightly different spot. Yeah. You know, and then it's like, um, and then that's the first place I feel like, you know, I went as far as learning about intonation. So I started going a long rant. No, here, but, no, I love it. But, um, but then the next place I went was discovering that, oh, but so now we have the open strings in tune and now that 12th fret, we got the intonation right there. 
But funny enough, when they play halfway up the neck at about the fifth or sixth fret, it's still not right. Yep. So then you have to begin to make choices. You're like, you know what? They're only playing the notes in the middle of the neck. Let's just tune those fucking notes yeah. to be right. And who cares what the open string is? Who cares what the twelfth fret is? We'll just make sure the open or the you know the notes that are getting played for that guitar part are right. Yeah. And I think that's where the you know the final frontier is for tuning is like you learn to check the tuning on the actual notes for those power chords yep. or for that guitar part right where it's getting played for this overdub. Make sure that's in tune. Well, and you, you got to remember in the studio. No one's really watching you, so anything goes. I've sat next to a guitar player holding the strings that he wasn't playing to yep. keep them from ringing. Or take a we piece taped, of tape, tape off them. the extra strings that aren't being used. Yeah, I've been down on my hands and knees, like manipulating pedals while it's going. It's like, you just got to do whatever you got to do to wrangle it. Yeah, and so another place, um, if we're going to move from guitar to bass for a second, maybe we should just jump into bass. Sure. Um, but a place that... You know, as a first discovery, is just how messy bass is until you start recording it in the studio. Sometimes you don't realize that, like, you know, you're you're playing a rock part with a pick, and just moving around and fretting these different notes. And when you put it under a studio magnifying glass, you realize you're like, man, that low E string didn't stop ringing when he went to the A string to start playing these other things. Right. And if you learn to be aware of that, either as a bass player or as a producer engineer, and help you know, mute that string for the bass player, it can start to clarify the bass. But I'm also describing a whole, we're talking about a whole lot of things that are, once again, like here we are trying to control everything right. in the studio. And ultimately you end up in a place where somebody just plays it really well. And that always sounds best. Yeah. You know? It's, a, it's, you know, it all comes back to the source, man. Yeah. But yeah, you know, with, with bass, I think that's probably the, the biggest learning curve for a band coming in is realizing like you can't really ever hear the bass the way that it is on records until you get into the studio, Yeah, you know? So, yeah. And not only that, but as a bass player, uh, you know, I think sometimes you can't really hear what the bass is doing until you hear it in the control room. Yeah, for sure. And a lot of times really what that, where that kind of manifests itself out is Stuff and, and also rock stars. Notes. We're talking about rock. This this yeah, yeah. happens more often than rock music. If it's singer songwriter and somebody's playing a tasteful, you know, finger part, um, that might be easier. They might be slightly more inclined to just you know have control over it. Yeah, even in headphones, I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, and in, in in the rock world, I think it it also comes down to like the proficiency of the bass player and um uh, it's almost like it is bass guitar in a rock band you know it's not just the bass it's not just foundational you're trying to uh do parts and add add color through the low end um so to me it's more the same as any other instrument it's like little a hundred thousand little baby steps that add up to yeah the sound that you're hearing. And, and I got to yeah. say, um, tuning on the bass, that is also a final frontier because that's the last place everybody remembers to look. Yeah. So on the guitar, somebody's playing a chord, everybody goes, you know, not everybody, but you as the engineer producer will be the first to go, that's not in tune because yeah. you hear the notes against each other. But one place we often forget to look is the bass because it's a single note, it's down low, but boy, it's a. It can make a big difference when that bass is really hitting the note and it's in tune, or if yep. it's slightly out, it sort of makes everything else sound, um, you know, like untethered. So. Yeah. One one trick that we definitely do a lot is uh, using the uh, bypass output of the tuner so that it, you can keep it on while you're tracking the bass. So you can look down and see if the fretted note is hitting it. Right. Yeah. Um, and for for guitar players and bass players. If you're hitting a single note and it's a little bit sharp, you know, push down on the note, push forward toward the bridge a little bit, and you just made that note a little flatter. Yeah, that's true. You can go. It's a you good, can go a little way either either direction that way, just yeah. with your fingers. You know, the uh, the other thing you got to watch out too, and in the low end department is that the bass and the the floor tom aren't competing with each other. You know. Uh, 
we'll spend a lot of time making sure that the tom is either in the key of the song or that it's ringing in a way that doesn't compete with the key of the song at all. Especially if it's like kind of like a, if the tom is going to be if it's riding the tom, yeah, like a, a big like part a simple, of the, yeah. the tune. I was just tracking a song last week where we had this gorgeous floor tom sound, and the drummer was playing with mallets, and and it was this big, huge drum sound. It was awesome, and we went to track the tune, and it was just like the whole time because yeah. the the floor tom and the bass were competing with each other, and and we kept. You know, we put a towel on the tom, taped the tom down, all everything we could do until we finally swapped the tom out for a smaller sounding and that was the trick. drum. And, and that was, was it the actually trick. a smaller size drum, yeah. too? Oh, smaller yeah, dynamic, for diameter. sure. And it didn't sound as good on its own as the big tom did, but in the context of the song, it was perfect. Yeah. You know, um, which that so, goes back to the source thing, man. Talk a little bit about, um, how if somebody's never tuned the drums to be in the key of the song, I remember hearing that for the first time, like, oh my God, it's brilliant. But yeah. then then you go try to begin to do it and you're like, man, this is hard. You it know, is. like where do I do it? So maybe talk a little bit about some of the process of actually tuning the drums to be yeah. in the key of the song. Like, does that happen out in a in the live room? Does that happen in the control room where you're hearing it through the speakers? Oh, uh-huh. um, uh, it's all out in the live room. Okay. And, and it definitely this is not something that is a every time you track, make sure the toms are in the key of the song. That I've I've found that each drum has its own natural resonance mm-hmm. that it likes mm-hmm. and in the room that you're in is reacting in the room. And that is where I start always is to get get each drum sounding like it's like the the maximum amount of force and power and ring and all of that. And then uh, if you if you pull up the song and you know let's say it's in the key of A or whatever and you and you start hitting the toms if tonally they aren't jiving with that key okay but but just for the dumb questions yeah what are we hearing while we're out in the room with the drums that makes us say, I hear that this is in tune against it would, that. It would be the overtone. And it's, I mean, it's, like, are we listening to the, do we have headphones on? Oh, no, what I'll do is like, or? is we have a piano in the room. I'll just hit the key so of just the song. So like, a, okay, great. That's yeah. the kind of stuff I was getting at. So like the simple idea of like, just go over to the piano that's right there in the same room, play that key. Um, assuming the tuner came recently. Right, right, totally. <laughs> or a guitar or and whatever. And you can kind of, that, that will help you that'll help inform you enough to know that you're in, you're getting your tune yes. right or wrong. And, and so yeah, hit the A on the piano or, or G or C or whatever the key is, and then hit the drum. And there's several things that you got to look for. Cause you got the initial attack of the drum, which is going to be really hard to like pinpoint that what we're looking at is the overtones that kind of last as the drums ringing out. And I say overtones because there's a lot of sounds coming off the head and we've taken our time to make sure that's that it's in tune with itself, you know, the tension's proper. Like if you just hit the drum by itself, you're like, that drum sounds good. Exactly. Sounds great. Exactly. And and hopefully it sounds great and you hit the key of the song and it's like, okay, it sounds good together. Let's go, you know. But uh, a lot of times what it'll be is like, if the song's in A, the natural overtone of the tom might be like just slightly flat or sharp in a way that you know that once you put a bass on, it's going to be competing yeah, for that you got space. Yeah, two low end notes that are. If there's one place in music where, uh, you know, out of tuneness, you know, minor seconds and stuff don't sound good, it's down yeah. down there in that low territory. Yeah. And so what what you want to do then, and it's really just a feel thing, is either tune it to where the drum sounds good, but it's not in that resonance, or try to tune it to the key of the song if it's close enough. Um, and really kind of how I learned that was, uh, I have a timpani, and learning that you do want to, to tune yeah, to the key of the very song. Yeah, that very pitch. And, uh, and so really what it is, uh, like I'll put a finger and just kind of, slightly dampen the middle of the head and kind mm-hmm. of go around 
to each, uh, hit the drum by each uh, tuning leg, peg. Yeah, each tuning leg, right? And and kind of just listen to to where the pitch is in relation to the key of the song, and see if we can get it to a place where it's happy. Like I said, I'm not. If the song's in A, it's not that the the t- top tom is a high A and the floor tom's a low A. It's just that they're somewhere in the scale of the song that yeah. that where it just feels jives. right. Yeah. Right. So let's say it's not feeling right. You can tell it's a little bit sharp or a little bit flat, or you can just tell it's a little bit off and you can't tell which one it is. You you talked about putting your finger over the the center of the head, slightly dampening it, which is the equivalent of doing that harmonic dampening on a guitar string where right. you're like you're doing the the first uh the the overtone the the twelfth fret uh-huh. um I think because it's changing it's taking out some of the the low thump out of the drum Correct. you can hear that where it's singing in the upper overtones, and then you just go tune the top legs. What about like tuning addressing the top of the head of the drum versus the bottom of the yeah. head what, how do you know when to do which and or is there an easy way for that? I mean, I feel like it's just trial and error. Yeah. But it, we're all stuck in the land of mystery, but I still yeah. feel like uh, you, as your confidence comes, you, you, you begin to do things and it's, yeah. and it tends to work, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that um, to me, the, the bottom head, I'll start with the top head. And if I can't get anywhere, then I know, well, maybe I need to drop the, the pitch on the bottom head or whatever Yeah, and kind of reevaluate. Um, and do you sometimes like mute the bottom head so that you feel like you're only hearing the top head yes. or vice versa? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sometimes I'll just reach down below and and hold it, uh, and just lightly tap the top head and see where we're at. Yeah. I also uh, have a guy with me at the studio, Devin. That that's my engineer. We've been working together for the last eight years, and he is a drummer. So I lucked out in that department that. He loves this stuff way more than I do. And in in terms of drum tuning and selecting the right drum and everything. And and so it makes it for a good combo because if I've worked myself to where I'm frustrated, he'll be like, let me back there, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and kind of finish the job or vice versa. Uh, so it's always good to have another set of ears, you know, yeah, someone definitely. that you trust uh, to kind of, Cause you can get too zoned in and he can be in the control room and be like, no dude, it sounds great. Let's stop right there and let's try it. You know? Yeah, totally. I've, I've experienced both. I've pulled up, I've had sounds that I thought were great, but then when you start soloing it and listening to it and and new with fresh ears in a, in a new context, you're like, man, how did that kick drum never quits or whatever. It's got a funny going on. And then, Vice versa. Sometimes you you hear those things and you're like, oh, that that's totally screwed up. Yeah. But then you go listen to the track and everything adds up and you're like, oh, it's it's fine, you know. I mean, so a couple of thoughts. One is, um, rock stars. When we're talking about drum tuning, um, you remember to think about notes. So tuning is notes together, right? So if the drum has some sustain, then it becomes a note. Yeah. And then you have to ask yourself the question of whether you want that note to be in tune with the other notes, right? Yeah. But if the drum's really quick, then it's maybe not really a note. Maybe it's more just percussive, and then it may not matter at all, you know? And I one think. good thing to to maybe highlight with both drums and guitar is if you're really having a frustrated time tuning and you've this is an instrument that you've worked with in the past and it hasn't been that way, then it probably means it's time to change the head or change the strings. Oh, interesting. Because yeah, totally. I, I know if I'm really wrangling a guitar and I'm like, man, I, I I usually haven't had this problem in the past. Usually a fresh set, set of strings will... You, you say to the other five people in the control room with a yeah. bead of sweat rolling yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, and so that goes back to that, what we were talking about before about those are the things that we kind of try to address before the talent walks in right, the room. Right, Is I'll get with Devin and be like, what drums do we need to change heads? You know, do I need to order some some new heads before we start this record and make sure we have backups? Yeah. I'll do the same thing with the guitars, like kind of go through and like, let's just spend a minute making sure we're dialed in before we get in the heat of it. And it, you know, some of it you can't 
it's going to happen, but we try to, uh, try to, try to get as much of that stuff taken care of. So I did a session recently where my, all my friends were coming down to record and I had some prep time. So I was like, I'm going to make sure we got strings and yeah. drum heads and stuff like that. And I did, I, I turned out I had some spare drum heads and they were clear ones, um, I guess they were just clear, clear yeah. like the double double ply with the oil in there or whatever. Uh -huh. And I swapped them out. And it was so funny. It was like, and I had the the coded ambassadors on, uh -huh. on before, something like that. Um, and they're all great drum heads and great, great drum tones. But again, like if I just hit the old ones, I might have gone, well, those still sound cool. You know, those, yeah. those are groovy um, by themselves out of context. But I put the new heads on anyway. And I was like, holy shit, that sounds so good. Yeah. It like, sounds like. These toms really sound killer now, yeah. you know? So it's a reminder. Sometimes you just need to trust that that process needs to happen. Now, the flip side to that is, no, you don't always have to put new heads on. And good Lord, on some guitars, you don't want to put new strings yeah. on. Don't put new strings on that bass guitar just before you record if right. you want it to have like a, you know, kind of a dark, you know, cool tone because it may sound too bright too. Yeah. Um, yeah, One, I've got a guitar at the studio that has flat wounds on it that I haven't changed in a decade. Right, and flat wounds are such cool tones. And that that's the sound. Yeah, you know. But there's other, you know, like a great telly, like with a fresh set of strings, you know, played for a, a little bit, let them kind of get yeah. situated. There's nothing better. You know. So all right, here's another tip I learned on the road about um, putting new strings on. Uh, guitar Tech showed it to me. So you put them on. And then immediately you have all these tuning issues and that's just part of new strings. Yeah. But he showed me how you take your hand and you sort of put your thumb on top of the string and then your fingers go underneath the string and your pinky back underneath the string and you do a bend. Uh -huh. So your thumb goes down, your fingers and pinky goes up. Don't go too far or you just like break the string right off. Yeah. But you do that, you start at the bridge and you do that little, that little bend and then you do the bend and you work your way down the string and that stretches it out. Yeah. So you've got the string itself stretching out just the metal of it, but you've also got the way it's wound on the peg down there, the more, you know, it's settling in and it's getting a tighter and tighter grip on the tuning peg. And these are all factors that go into sort of the way the string's slipping on you. Yeah. You know, so if you can kind of get it s stretched and everything, it's much easier to get it in tune and have it hold right away. Yeah, and when, when I say a fresh set of strings, w what we mean is like strings have been put on and then had that time for them to kind of settle in. And, yeah. And Day before is a great time. Five minutes before you're about to overdub, not such a great time. Exactly. Because you'll be fighting different tuning issues. Exactly. Yeah, back when I worked at that music store in Mississippi – one of the most valuable lessons I learned was like kind of proper string technique from the the repair guy there because what a lot of people tend to do is overwind on the peg. So you've got all this extra string that right, too much string. That's it's not serving a purpose other than it's going to keep slipping until the string settles and it's just going to take longer for for the guitar to get in a spot where it stays in tune, you know. Um, there's a couple of tricks that I that I learned that um, I don't know if I can describe them entirely, but let's say you have on my Stratocaster, I've got the f uh, six guitar tuners all going in a row, and the the low E is the first one on the on the head. Um, so I'll take the E string and I go through that tuning peg, um, and I pull it, you know, finger tight. So I'm not really it's not tight yet, but it's just yeah. there's no there's no loose slack in the string it's straight across the neck and i'll go to the, yep. the next tuning peg and that's how much length i need yep and then i come back um and i bend it back down uh-huh so that it's so that it's going um what is it it's uh i, I don't know how to describe it but it's like opposite the direction of the, what it's going to turn and you go underneath itself where it's going into that tuning thing and then pull it back up and then uh, begin tuning. And what happens is you, um, you, that, that little extra loop that comes back and, and hooks around the string as you tune it. And as that string tightens and it pick, picks up the slack. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I went to the A string and then I, then I came back to, to the E string and then bent right. it. But it, what it does is that that string that's coming up gets, gets uh, pinched 
underneath itself as yep. it's tuning around the peg. And that's like that extra, it's a trick for giving it a little bit of extra grab on there, you know? Yeah, for sure. But then like, you know, when you wind it on and you've got, you know, I don't know, like what, a few wines. You definitely max. want, you want like one and a half good round the peg. All right, there you go. Wine. That's a, that's a more useful figure. You the, can, you well, can the, do. kind of the, the thing that I learned is if you pull it finger tight to the, uh, to the peg and then you take your right, if the guitar was sitting in your lap and you take your right hand and grab the string, if you give the guitar the middle finger, whoops, and and pull the string up, a middle finger's worth of string That gives you just enough space. slack for the wind? Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's good. That's good. So yeah, just for clarity, says rock stars, we're not saying to pull it through and immediately start winding or else right. you won't even have, you won't have one enough. wind, you know, so you... It's, a, it's figuring out the just right amount of slack for your string. Yeah. All right, well, that's a cool thing. One other thought that popped into my mind as we were talking about the drums and like, you know, sometimes you hear stuff under the magnifying glass where you're like, the pick, kick drum pedal is squeaking, yes. you know? And you're like, it, you know, it's kind of like the buzz in the bass. It's the easy to think rattle, you've got a problem and not know if it's really a problem until later. And um, sometimes you have these things that you think are problems and then, when you when you finish the track out and you didn't do anything about it, you're like, oh, that wasn't a problem at all. And so I just wanted to remind you that we have something in sound called masking. So masking is when you know you have two two notes or two tones that are near each other and one's louder than the other. The quieter one disappears and we no longer hear it. It's actually part of what makes MP3s possible with yeah. all this compression schemes and stuff like that. But I think that applies to things that we think might be a problem in the track too. But by the time you're done with the track, it's no longer, it's masked and you don't hear it. Right. And so it's also the reverse problem, which is like why everything sounded great in the chorus, but now we're in the um, in the naked verse and you're like, oh crap, I hear that whatever sticking through now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, where I where I kind of notice that the most in modern recording is just noise floor. Like we the computer era, which I guess I would would be in uh that age group or whatever, we haven't had to deal with signal to noise ratio as much right. as our predecessors. And so a lot of times people won't know that there's too much hiss on a vocal or whatever right. until you start mixing the song and you put on your two bus processing and all that. And all of a sudden it's like, why is it like yeah, up here? Everything gets amplified and, and hyped up. And I'm sure the older guys are laughing like, yeah, that, that was my entire life dealing with tape, you know, is figuring out, uh, you know, it's awesome that we live in a world where you don't, you don't have to get the sound as hot as possible to Pro Tools, yeah. you know, the way that uh, you do with the tape. But it's important to to kind of be aware of, uh, you know, in a practical sense, let's say you have a mic pre, an EQ, and a compressor, and the compressor has an output stage. Um, when you're setting your, your level to, t to Pro Tools, the gain knob of the mic pre is going to be the cleanest way to get louder, not the output of the compressor, because all you're doing is raising the noise floor of the the unit itself. Right. And so a lot of times a mistake I'll see made is like people make adjustments on the last knob available. Right. And really what they're doing is just boosting noise yeah, as opposed to there. the mic pre, you know. Um, it's just well, those was, little things. I was dealing with that uh, again. Thank you for coming here for the interview. So I was, um, at first I was trying to put together my portable rig to come, come yeah, to yeah. you. Um, and I have this portable Tascam DR40. It's a great little thing. I thought this would be so great. It's so yeah. small and portable. And I took my two, uh, mic tech PM nine dynamic mics, plugged it straight into that, went to record it. I set my levels. I'm like, this is going to be great. And I go and I pull the files in and it was like, shh. Yeah. I was like, are you kidding? Yeah. What? You know, so I guess, uh, and I don't think my unit's broken. I think it's just the nature of it. I think it's sure. designed to use the kind of condenser mics that are very hot and clean already that are yeah. built in. But it's understanding that kind of stuff and understanding that like, you know, if I can't turn the mic pre up to the right level and, I, and I'm still getting that noise, then this may be a problem, yeah. you know, and, and I tried using noise filtering afterwards and it was not really happening. So I was like, all right. 
it's fix um, it at the source. Man. But I'm, I would, you know, I know that because I've experienced it in a, in a bunch of places. But um, you know, beforehand, I probably would have totally stumbled through that and screwed it up for a while before yeah. uh, before I realized that there was a cleaner way to do it. Um, and actually, the thing I'm thinking of, I haven't tried yet, is the the cloud lifters, um, which I know will give me the 48 volt, give me more amplification. Yeah. I just don't know. I guess I'll try that and see if yeah. that's a good solution or if that's just. Sometimes you're just moving the noise floor to a different location and it's the same problem. Right. Well, I'm glad that it worked out the way that it did because I love seeing other people's spaces. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, I was looking forward to seeing yours too. And Rockstars, again, check the show notes because there's a link to um, Paul's studio, the Smokestack. And I think you really enjoy it and seeing the video that you put together there and stuff. But let's let's cut to a couple more questions. So here's another one. Um, on the good by June record also as well, like the drums are super punchy and they come through the track. They sound great. But I also noticed that um, you may have some subtler things that help make it make sense. And uh, one of those might be just like the proper use of reverb on your drums. Yeah. Um, wh- what do you want to say about reverb treatments that make sense with drums? Is it always the room mics or are there some tricks that you lean towards in the mix stage where you have to add something that wasn't, you know, didn't come through a microphone? It's it's both. It just totally depends on the band. With Goodbye June, and what I've found with rock music, I love a gorgeous uh, room mic setup on the drums. But a lot of times, especially in a rock mix, there might not be that amount of space available Uh for the roominess of the drums, but using an artificial reverb can give you that same feeling of the big, the bigness of the drums without taking up space from the guitar. And so we did have room mics on the goodbye jeans stuff, but they would have been lower in the mix. Also too, because when you're, when you're dealing in rock music, the first thing to kind of ruin the the room sound is when a drummer starts hammering on the cymbals. Right, totally. And, you know, this is loud rock and roll stuff. So the uh, for me, I think I used like a lexicon type. Uh, uh, like a PCM verb or something like big that. Big room. Uh, what I was using was a 300, uh, which is like the little brother of the, mm. the 400. Uh, but uh, just like a big, uh, I think it was wood large wood room or something like that and uh so as you know in in the mix stage let's say we get our drum sound up and it's a mix of the close mics and the room mics i would then just send um either the room mics to the reverb or the close mics depending on the sound it's interesting I, I, i think about the snare as being sent to that room sound but interesting that sending the room mics themselves to it can do a cool thing. Yeah. For me, uh, probably most of the sound of that is maybe a little bit of the snare and a lot of the the room mic to the the verb. Super cool. Um, um, is there also a thing where, you know, sometimes we send it to the verb and it's coming back and we're like, why does that not sound right? And then you have to do a little EQing to that verb and you have to maybe also run that verb through a compressor before it, does the right kind of thing? Sometimes. It just depends on the mix again. Um, the EQ, definitely. I don't know if I've ever compressed a verb coming back in. Would you but, um, take the verb and send it straight to the two bus, or would it maybe go through sort of like the drums parallel compression? Uh, I usually go straight to the two bus. Like okay, dig it. Um, but one thing I do do with the drums that's been really helpful in a rock mix situation. I do do my drums all the yeah. time, man. <laughs> Is uh, I will have the kick and snare sent to a transient designer and have that on its own two faders, kick, snare, and toms, so that let's, you know, we got our drum mix up and I start bringing guitars and vocals and everything. And the first thing to kind of lose that attack and presence is the kick and snare mm-hmm. when you get the mix going. And then, so having two extra faders of the, the processed, if you will, uh, kick and snare to pull up into the mix really helps kind of get it to fight through. Yeah. I think that's great. That, that was really kind of at the core of my question about the, the goodbye June drums too, is I remember yeah. hearing that and thinking like, it's so cool how the drums just like, 
they kind of spit through the tra- track just yeah. right so that they they come just through enough to yeah to that would be right the, the transit designer for sure Dig it. and then um i guess we could talk about mixing a little bit um you know and and again we still we keep not talking about tape but yeah um, well, that's is, a big part of the drum sound on that record. Yeah, I was going to say, sure. is tape an important thing for making um, rock records? And is a console an important thing? Uh, for me, both of them, yes. Um, necessary, no. But important to to the way that I work, absolutely. Because um, what I really like about tape, obviously the sound... Uh, what you know when we're tracking we'll track to pro tools and to tape and so when we first listen back we're listening back to the digital copy but as soon as we flip to the tape it's it's like everybody in the room goes oh wow yeah that sounds like a record now you know and it's just that thing but what i really like about it more than the sound maybe at at this point is when you tell a band we're cutting the tape we can't slide your note, you know. We can punch you, but it's going to be difficult. And you guys are all playing together. So when you mess up, you might be messing up his perfect take, you know. Right. It adds this sense of urgency that we're missing in a Pro Tools world where you can... The The beautiful thing about uh, computers is we can kind of work our way out of a lot of sticky situations yeah, yeah. that you can't with tape. And what's funny is in the end, we still have all that technology available to us, but I like to pretend with the band that they got to do it the way that their heroes did it. And what happens is everybody sits up on the edge of their seat a little bit more and they take it more seriously because they don't want to, they don't want to be the one to screw up, you know, everybody else's day. And what I've found is what that adds to the recording is when you get a group of people focused on the same thing at the same time and they're all putting their energy in, there's a collective thing that happens that is a glue on the take that is really what I'm looking for. Yeah. And could we do that without tape? Totally. But it's a great tool for me to be able to kind of convey that to the band. And so my daughter's playing a lot of soccer now and I'm, I'm like the soccer dad on the sidelines yeah. yelling at, at the kids and getting all into it. Turns out I'm a super sports fan. I, okay. I, but it, but only of my it daughter's soccer kids, team, yeah. you know what I mean? But it makes me think of like a coach for a team. And it's like, can you imagine a coach for a team um, saying, you know, how would you guys like to be, how would you like to go for the playoffs? You know, how would you like to, really go for it. Like, you know, this is it. Yeah. Don't, don't ever quit. Don't ever phone it in. And you've got a shot at doing something great versus a coach. It's like, Oh, it's okay. Just go on out there. You just do your best. Right. You know, like if we lose, it's all right. You know, it's like, which, what's the result going to be from either of those? And I feel like it's similar to what you described for the band going in and doing the tape thing where it's like, you know, if everybody's in it to win it, you get a different experience. Yeah. And plus, you know, when we listen to music, we love talking about all the tech stuff, all the other stuff, but in the end, at the end of the day, what we're listening to is like the human experience. We Absolutely. pick up on that. It's like you get excited by hearing somebody sound like they're having fun doing a record and playing the song or somebody like really trying really hard to get there and, yeah. and then just, you know, achieving that goal. In fact, I talk about that when it comes to vocal tuning. Um, I noticed that if I overtune a vocal it actually takes it takes the the energy out of yep. it and it, and it, what might have sounded like like there was real struggle to accomplish something with by hitting a note can go away and it can make a vocal sound like somebody was just yeah real relaxed and it was like yeah. it was a breeze it was easy you know absolutely and man. it's a real tricky balance between all those well things. my thing and the goodbye june's a good reference too of like uh so there's certain landmarks that we use to to say when something's good in in modern recording so the drums are done when you've got them all gridded out and you have your samples in place and it looks a certain way and the vocals done when it's you've comped and you've pulled all the breaths back and you've tuned it and all that stuff and and so 
those markers of being done really don't mean anything to the listener, right? Right. And so what if a vocal's done, quote unquote, not when those things have been done to it, but when it's in a spot where it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up? Right. What if the drums are done when the performance is so compelling you want to hear it again? And so for me, it's like, well, let's not let's not automatically do anything to anything. Cause the 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 especially in this town in Nashville, they'll they'll rent Blackbird, you know, for I don't know what it costs, two grand a day or whatever. Then they'll hire Johnny Session that's played on all of the the records. He's great. And yeah, he'll come in. They're gonna pay him a grand. They'll rent drums. They'll put up the most expensive mics, all this stuff, and they'll get the performance of a lifetime. And they're like, that's it. And then they'll take it and they'll chop the whole thing up and put it on a grid. And it's like, you just spent all this money, all this time, all this energy and hired the right guy. And now you're going to computerize his performance. Computerize. Yeah. And for me, Beat Detective is a great tool. Auto-tune and Melodyne are great tools, but let's just have those in our toolbox and be discerning about when we use them and when we don't. Yeah. And, and rock music, just like any other genre, has suffered from overproduction, over fiddling and editing. And uh, to me, that's what makes Led Zeppelin great, you know? Yeah. Is you, you can go to a song and this might be a fun th- fun thing for some of you guys to try at home. Go to a, go to the first uh, verse of a Led Zeppelin tune and tap out the tempo along, you know, on some app on your phone or something along with the thing. And then go to two minutes into the song and tap again and see. Yeah. It might be close, but it's there's no exactness to it because they didn't record it to a grid. They yeah. recorded it to a tape and they had to use their ears because they couldn't look at anything. Well, I mentioned Jack White before and and I remember when um, White Stripes did Get Behind Me Saint, Uh I think was the song. And there was a big article about like, you know, we're bringing it back to old school where it's like, you know, they went in and they recorded it and within two weeks it was out and on the radio and it was like, yeah, you know, don't, don't over labor it, just like go for it. And I listened to the track and I was like, I was like, I totally hear the tempo changes and everything. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, but who cares? You know, yeah. it's about feel. <laughs> it was about feel. It was fun. Like if it feels good to speed it up. Yeah. Great. If it feels good to slow it down, then do it. You know? Yeah. It's when it's those problems when, when, when they're messing up the feel of the song, because it's just like, you know, somehow the process or the band is like unable to deliver the thing that feels good enough. Yeah. And it becomes a distraction that's that I think those tools can come in useful and, yeah. and helpful. Absolutely. Um, and you know, it what yeah. it what it comes down to is there's no right or wrong. It's it's a totally subjective art form. And so what you're trying to do is collectively get the people that are involved to all say, This is awesome. I believe yeah. in this. And however that has to happen is is anybody's guess, you know? Um, we've been going for a good long stretch. I so many fun questions I could ask you. I still got a list of questions, but yeah, um, man. we did mention vocals and you talked about like, you know, the done quality and it's like the breaths are knocked down and stuff like that. So uh, on the Matt Kearney or Kearney, uh, Kearney record, yeah. um, it's got a great compressed vocal in the mix too. And I wondered if you could talk about some of the cool ways to mix a vocal and compress it and then also, what are the things that happens when you begin to do that that you might need to address? Like, how do we deal with too much sibilance if we use a lot of compression? Yeah. You know, what are some go-to um, ways to handle that stuff? And Absolutely. are any of them easy? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I can't take credit for that mix. That was Michael Brower. Um, oh, nice. Uh, Way to go, Michael. But, uh, but I can speak to... Uh, when you start compressing a vocal, you get all, you know, I feel like you can start to get the artist's soul kind of coming through what yeah. you're, what you're bringing out, but what you can tend to, to do, uh, 
just like anything else, when you start raising level like that, is it's going to bring up everything around the artist. So for me, being co- confident about where we're cutting the vocal, that when we compress it, we're not compressing the road noise, you know, of the cars driving by or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so because you're bringing up all this, all the quiet stuff, you're making it loud. Exactly. Um, but you know, it, it's also going to bring out any S's and T's and syllables uh, that I, I tend to not try to overcompress uh, when I'm tracking a vocal. Just get good level to tape and um, th- have the compressor definitely. Um, helping level out the the peaks and valleys of the the vocal, if you will. But um, to me, DSing and um, and really just kind of cleaning up the vocal is what I do in a mix. Yeah. So, but like, how do you? What are some techniques for DSing a vocal? Is it just like throw a DSer plug in on? And if so, does it go before all the compression? Does it go after all the uh-huh. compression? Stuff like that. I tend to, uh, I've never really even thought about it. I tend to DS post compression. At the point of where the S's are super hyped up. Right, right. Which makes some sense. Maybe that's an easier time for the DSer to identify that S and and compress it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I might need to try it the other way. I don't know if I've ever done it. I'm learning something new here myself. Um, How about do you um, take advantage of, you know, being able to go in visually in Pro Tools and just knock S's down and that with, kind of stuff. With vocals, yes. I don't tend to fiddle with a lot in terms of drums and guitars and um, except maybe like deciding if, you know, let's say a guitar player didn't play for a verse and there's just right. of his amp. Is that cool? Is it adding something to the song? Right. Or do, Sometimes it's cool to hear yeah. all that. Or do we take it out? A lot of times a guitar player because they're tracking in the room with the drummer, they're not playing on the verse, but the drums are coming through the pickups. pickups, That's cool. You know? So just try to pay attention to that. But with the vocal, um, I feel like that's where I'm so thankful. I live in this age of computer technology because I will use every bit of it to help enhance the vocal. So if it's, we've compressed, uh, you know, this female singer and it just sounds like you're right there in the room with her and she's whispering to you and it's beautiful. But every time she takes a breath between, like, you know, <sighs> yeah. I don't know. So I use the D breath plug and mix yeah. the podcast. We'll see if it caught that or not. <laughs> uh, for me, you know, just going through and it it's laborious, but taking those and I still want to hear her breathing. Like I don't want it to go away. Uh, and sound like we fiddled with it. So I might just find for that song, I'll play with the first couple of breaths and find out, okay, if I drop them 10 dB, that feels like a natural thing or whatever. Um, And then just kind of go through the song that way. Uh, It helps with any kind of uh, things that a pop filter didn't catch. You can kind of round off those, those, I don't want to do it, you know, the poppy peas or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and a lot of times, like, um, lip smacks, too. There's a great plug-in um, suite that we got maybe a year ago. Uh, Is it Isotope? Isotope, yeah. Yeah. That has changed my life. Because I used to go in and zoom way into the vocal and draw out yeah, lip smacks. Yeah. I almost bought one of those... Um the what's it called like the the bamboo um pen and and big plastic things so like so that i could more easily draw in pro oh, tools yeah, yeah. i thought about yeah. getting that one day yeah i didn't and i don't think i need it now but yeah so rockstar's isotope rx6 the, is what i got now and they may be beyond that uh already the D, but d click it's like the mouse clicker yeah, or, spinner or something like that they just got all these great plugins and um it's a great tool and if you want to get dig in you can actually use their app and like pull your wave file into it and completely like see the whole, um, you know, the color sc- scheme image yeah. and and draw things out that way. But but the plugins make it easy where you just pop it on there. And, and that, that's a great about. example of 
not using technology to um, to make up for crappy performance, but taking a performance that's amazing and using the technology to to get rid of just some of the blemishes. Yeah, the stuff on that would it. be distracting. Yeah, it's not even yeah, getting rid of blemishes or just maybe those mouth noises are so loud now that they become they sound like a percussion part. Right. Where you're like, that's not a per- that doesn't help the song. Exactly. Um, so then also, you know, stuff that pops into mind. So for D breaths, um, rock stars, you can select the breath where it happens and you could like, you know, hit command E and it'll chop it in pro tools. And then I don't use the quick key for this, but I know there is one where you can clip gain down. You could, I think you can hit the key to like come down so many clicks pretty oh, easily, wow. or you could use, um, you know, you could create your own scripts. Sometimes you can use other parties like Auto- Automator and uh, Apple uh, applications like that and create some sort of like automatic, you know, shrink it a certain right. amount thing. But that, you know, these all these great techniques, the first time you do them, they can take forever. Yeah. You know, it can feel like, oh man, this takes forever. But when you begin to figure out ways to quicken your, your, work your workflow, flow, yeah. then it can become much more routine and stuff. Um, dude, we've been going for ages. So this is awesome. Um, maybe tell us about your monitors in the studio. Just tell us how you like to listen. How do you get low end right when uh-huh. you're making these records? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm a classic NS10. Hell guy. yeah. Way to go, dude. <laughs> I don't even use the sub with mine. Oh, that's um, awesome. Talk about, um, I don't know. Have you tried a sub before and was it a negative experience for you? Yeah. No, and and you know, we have mains with the subs and they're the when the band gets the take and you come in and you want to high five each other, you know, you yeah, crank put it, it up. up on the bigs. And you know, when I'm dialing in sound, if I'm if I'm, you know, dialing in the sub kick, I'll crank those and and kind of work on it that way. But uh, you know, it just goes back to the same reason everybody else uses NS10s. It's like I've just gotten used to the way that they present music and and uh the biggest thing for me honestly in terms of of low end and phase and how things are correlating across the spectrum is just to to be in mono, you know. Uh I'll flip I flip between mono and stereo all day when I'm mixing. Mm. And uh I usually what? do most of my rides in mono. Okay, cool. Um uh, yeah, I was going to say, tell the rock stars, what, what are some things that become obvious to you when you go to mono? Yeah. Well, okay. So what you got to understand, I guess, is in mix, in, in my opinion, the most important things are in the center. So you have the vocal, the kick drum, the snare, the bass guitar, and then everything else kind of lives out on the edges. Maybe a lead guitar part is in there. And so those are the things that are constantly in the center of your, your stereo spectrum. And everything else kind of lives out on the edges. And so when you when you collapse a mix into mono, you really get a sense of where that stuff fits in context with the stuff that's taking your attention on the sides. And I've found that my fades are less drastic. Uh, when I say fades, like my uh, my rides on a vocal mm-hmm. will be less drastic if I'm in mono but have more of an impact and be, you can keep the vocals sitting in that, that place that you want it to be where it's like, it's not separate from the music, but it's audible and clear. I can kind of keep it there and I do all my rides. And then when I bring it out into stereo, it may sound like it's buried a little bit. And so my tendency is to want to, Oh, well now I need to make the vocal louder, but then it, it, it gets, where it starts sounding separate from the yeah. track. Yeah, and, when, and you know, if it's where it feels a little buried, when you take that out of the studio, that ends up making more sense. Exactly, right, right? exactly. Yeah, so another trick I started doing for mono on my NS10s was um, I'll actually, my my interface, this dangerous audio, will let me mute one or the other speakers. So I'll put it in mono and then mute one speaker and just look at one of my NS10s. Nice. Sometimes I mix like that for a little while down at a lower level. And I really enjoy that. Um, and you can turn the sub off too, you know, yeah. and really just like here. I, I find that the tricks like that, trying the auto tone, speaker, mono, yep. stuff like that, they're a version of us saying, 
let's just simplify all this shit. Yeah. You know, let's get it down to something that's really small and simple and quiet. And we're no longer big badasses with the studio. We're yeah. just like a clock radio playing somewhere. And, and it's amazing how quiet like, like that. I, I mix very quiet. Because I feel like that's where you can really kind of tell the differences that you're. Yeah. It, it everything becomes more subtle then, you yeah. know. And a fa- a ride on a guitar solo that I might push five dB if I have it cranked because I'm trying to get over the pressure of the room itself, you know. When I'm quiet, I might be able to get away with the same ride at two and a half dB. Yep. And when you go out of the studio, it translates better. Another thing for me is just having a good pair of headphones. I do so much work on headphones. What man. kind of headphones do you like using? Um, I have those Audio Technica, whatever the the main ones. Which that, ones are they? AT blah blah blah. As rock stars help us out. Yeah, <laughs> just their, their yeah. They, you know, it is a testament to what happens in the studio. Once we get something go- that works, we're like. That problem solved. Yeah. And I'm going to go think about this one, and then we just use it. And like a lot oh, yeah. of times, I forget. You I've know, got it. I'm not. I'm not name dropping it often enough to remember the titles. Exactly. Or something, you know? I've probably got 20 pairs at the studio because we got them at all the stations. You yeah. Know? Um, and what I've found, man, is that once I've, you know, I'll get my mix dialed in, maybe take a break. A lot of my little nuanced stuff, like what you're talking about with the vocal, uh, going through and and really fine tuning everything I'll do on headphones because it stuff just, it, it's just a different listening experience, yeah. you know? Yeah. Dig it, man. We've been going for, for this, is like the longest episode yet. It's awesome. <laughs> um, let me jump yeah. to the last question. Yeah. Uh, our last two questions we'll get out. You have a wonderful website. Oh, Part, one of the things you did is you created, you've got this video that kind of tells your story in a really cool way. Yeah. And I wonder if you just wanted to share a little bit of insight to the rock stars about like, you know, why did you do that? Why would you want a video of yourself on your studio website? Any anything like that? Yeah. Well, you know, the the way it came about was kind of funny. It was, you know, there was a, a guy needing to make some music and we did a trade for me, you know, producing a few songs for him and him making that video for me, which if you're going to have a life in music, you got to get used to the barter system because there's a lot of this stuff that that happens. So uh, we made I made an EP for him and and he did this video and and it was really kind of his idea of like man I want people to be able to have just a three minute clip to kind of see what I've been around. He had been in a band that I produced as well, so we had we were good friends and known each other for a while. And uh, he was like, I feel like the way that you're going about it is just set apart from you know a lot of the way Nashville maybe thinks about the music business and yeah. And he's like, you preach this stuff all day when we're working in the studio. I'd, I'd love to try to just make that. And so I, I went with him. It was totally his idea. And, uh, and, you know, I think it's something that the reason it's still up is I still get people that are like, man, I was so inspired by that video, you yeah. know? So if that's the only. Well, so rock stars, it's like this, it's Paul sharing his philosophy of making a record, just like yeah. we just did for, you know, two and a half hours right now. But, <laughs> um, you know, talking about making records and what, what kind of stuff's important in the process and everything like that. Um, and it's a shorter video. What is it, like three minutes or yeah, something, something like, like that? Maybe. that. But the shot is you getting on your motorcycle and yeah. riding all across Nashville. It's, you're like this, you're like, this is so interesting. We're talking about how to make a record, but you're riding a motorcycle and then you arrive at the studio and you yeah. walk in and then we see the inside of the studio and like yeah. the drums and the guitars and the process and stuff like that. And I thought that was cool. And it, what I think was a great takeaway is that, you know, as a studio, as a business, as a producer, as a business, whatever you're doing to work with other people, you have to differentiate yourself and you have to build some trust with with your clients and you have to let them know what you do. And you did it in a clever way that isn't just like, it, it's not like, hey, here's our studio. We've got feature, 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 right. feature. It was like, here's what I think about making records, but it speaks to, I think, the artists and the bands that might come work with you. They might be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. So Rockstars, I encourage you to think about like, you know, your website 
And uh, a video is a, it's a pretty easy way to do stuff. A highly produced one can maybe be more difficult, but literally, and you kind of editing an iMovie with an iPhone and just talking about the stuff you do and doing some shots of your studio, just think about like, what is it that's important to you about making a record and how do you like to help the people you're working with? And that might be a great way to put something together that can help promote your studio. Yeah. And don't be fooled by the video because like there, there's one shot where it does a pan of my live room and it looks like looks gigantic or something. Super pro. <laughs> that was we used my intern's skateboard and put the the he had a Canon D5. Oh, that's awesome. We put it on the skateboard and just gently pushed it across the room. That's awesome. And I think so, you had like a big old like um like a um what is it a something king um kick drum and the uh, oh yeah probably Radio King yeah Radio King kick drum and and the big drum kit and then all the guitars lined up and I also yeah. thought about that afterwards and I was like. I bet they may have like put the stuff out for the video too, you know, like yeah. during a session, you probably like the guitars are maybe like over here a little bit right. or whatever, but that's so funny. You know, so it's cool to make your studio look real nice for the video shoots. Yeah, man. Um, all right. So last question, Paul, this is hypothetical. We're going to go take the way back studio machine. You're going to go back in time, find young Paul, who's just won his first guitar in a contest. It's a great story, by the way. Yeah. Um, and you're going to say, dude, you know, I know I'm older now and I got dreadlocks and you don't have dreadlocks <laughs> yet, but um, I come to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you go back and give yourself if you could? Man, to only care about the music and to only love, only care about what you love. Yeah. Because uh, the the thing that's almost derailed me time and time again is, and it goes back to that quote is comparing yourself to others, getting caught up in the business side of it, especially like corporate music business. Um, You got to do it because you love it. It's too hard to, to not, it's like any art form. You got to kind of suffer for it. So doing it because you love it and not get caught up with, you know, other people's perceptions of, of you or anybody else. Yeah. I mean, Nashville's a real mix of like, you know, music for art and music for, for, um, business, you know, as well. And when your friend shows up in the the brand new Range Rover with leather seats and the amazing stereo in there and, you know, video screens everywhere, it's very easy to see that and be like, Hmm, maybe, maybe I should really be, you know, doing, doing more of that. But I agree. It can derail you from from your vision of what really just turns you on about music. And so maybe that's it. It's be yourself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Dig it. I agree, man. I think you do your best work when you when you are yourself as well. Agreed. Dude, thanks so much for joining us on yeah, the podcast. Well, what a pleasure. I think we're, we're both our eyes are like at half mass <laughs> now. That You're was a long take a one. nap. And thanks, Rockstars, very much for listening. Um, Paul, let the Rockstars know how they can find you online. How can they follow you? What if they got a killer record to make? Yeah. Uh, you can go to my website. It's www.paulmokemusic.com. Uh, that's probably the best way to reach me. I'm pretty active on Instagram most of the time. The others, I really am not. <laughs> I've only got room in my life for the one. So, uh, find me on Instagram or my website. If they want to go check out the smokestack, they go to paulmoke.com. Yeah, it's all there. Great. And that's M-O-A-K, yep. Rockstars. Dude, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. We'll see you around the studio. We'll see you around Nashville, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks, rock stars. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Oh,